Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm Stephanie Plunkett, Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the Norman Rockwell Museum, and we are so pleased that you're able to join us for this Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies exploration of the art of fantasy inspired by fairy tales and mythology. This special program is created in conjunction with our current exhibition, Enchanted, a history of fantasy illustration, which will be on view through October 31st here at the Norman Rockwell Museum. Uh, we have a wonderful program for you this morning. And that actually begins with a little bit of a sweep uh, in looking at the art of Norman Rockwell and his own flights of fantasy uh, with a talk that I'm gonna give uh, called Real and Imagined Fantastical Rockwell. And that will be followed by two panels. Our first will begin at 1045 and go to 1145 uh, called The Fairy Tale and Fantasy Art with author and folklorist Jane Yolen and illustrator Ruth Sanderson. And our second panel will begin at 12 o'clock and go until about one. And that is called The Making of Myths with artists Victor Nye, Justin Gerard, and Ian McCaig. Uh, so we are going to get started and I'm just going to begin sharing my screen so that uh, we can look at a little bit of Rockwell. And if you do wind up having um, questions along the way, please do not hesitate to put your questions in the chat and we will um, try to pick them up and respond as quickly as possible. So let's see, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I'm going to actually start with a George Lucas quote which is Rockwell recorded our fantasies and ideals and gave us a sense of what was in our heads and our hearts. An ardent and perceptive observer, Norman Rockwell was a persuasive visual commentator whose realist painters, paintings for popular periodicals inspired belief by millions in the innate goodness of humanity and the achievability of the American dream. Nurturing our love of fantasy in ways that the artist himself may not have fully perceived, his carefully constructed illustrations for the Saturday Evening Post and other magazines, and for hundreds of 20th century advertisers and products are the work of a consummate myth maker who understood his audience's deepest desires and spoke to them from the heart. And you're seeing him here in his Stockbridge, Massachusetts studio which is on the museum's grounds. As art critic Peter Sheldahl aptly noted, Rockwell's precisely observed facts squared with deeply serious hopes, and his pictures constitute an accurate a graph, as we have, of what being an American, a fictive condition always could feel like. Despite the complications of life or beca perhaps because of them, Rockwell pictured a world that he and many others wished to inhabit. His recurring motifs, children enjoying the company of their elders, patient parents, newsy but benevolent, benevolent neighbors as we see here, resourceful girls and women, and later principled freedom fighters reflected mores that society embraced, but sometimes fell short of fulfilling. Embedded within his humor and pathos were conceptions of heroism, patriotism, individuality, and equality, ideals that have helped sustain us in good times and bad. His artworks, though realist, portrayed ideas rather than actualities. And it is perhaps no surprise that Rockwell's psychoanalyst, Eric Erickson, who was seen here, observed that the artist painted his happiness, pouring his energy into whatever happened to be on his easel at the time. Storytelling was Rockwell's passion, as well as a shield against uncertainty and despair. For 60 years, he willfully, his willfully hopeful constructions, aspirational fantasies, celebrated commonalities, and helped us to galvanize America by envisioning 
its dreams and desires, as with these uh, World War II covers featuring the fictional hero, Willie Gillis. Film directors George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, who have explored themes of fantasy and science fiction in their work, are both admirers of Rockwell's narratives and collectors of his art. Washington Post film, crit film critic Ann Hornaday once remarked that the two directors' movies have tapped into the mass audience's most fundamental hunger for archetype and myth an observation that could likewise be applied to Rockwell. Committed to entertainment, these three master storytellers offer something more profound. Early in my career, Rockwell said, I discovered that funny ideas, pure gags were good, but funny ideas with pathos were better. Not only pathos though, he said, just something deeper. An idea which is only humorous doesn't stay with people, but if the situation depicted has some overtones or undertones, something beyond humor, it sticks with people and they like it much more. Rockwell's love of fantasy was first inspired by literature. Many of his artworks feature men and boys engrossed in reading like the young man in this 1923 boy reading adventure story. Highlighting the importance of literature as a source of inspiration generally and to Rockwell personally throughout his life. Captivated by the stories of Charles Dickens, which his father read out loud in the evenings after dinner, Rockwell was inspired as a boy to draw their characters as he listened. His father read he said, in an even colorless voice, the book laid flat before him to catch the light, full, uh, the full light of the lamp, the muffled voices of the city, the rumble of a cart, and a shout becoming the sounds of the London streets. As a lifelong reader of Dickens, Rockwell adopted the author's literary view, observing the world around him for its rich narratives and characterizations. By his own report, Rockwell's parents supported his decision to, at, to attend art school after seeing an impressive drawing of Ebenezer Scrooge, the cold-hearted miser who eventually finds redemption which was created as he listened to a reading of A Christmas Carol. In the 1920s and 30s, Saturday Evening Post cover illustrations by Rockwell and his friend and chief competitor, J.C. Leyendecker, promoted a fantastic holiday-themed symbolism, showcasing jolly, plausible Santas, posh, religiously inspired costume pieces, and old English scenes infused with literary overtones. One of these, Rockwell's December 17, 1938 cover painting, which the post titled, Mr. Pickwick sets out by the Muggleton coach for Christmas at Dingley Dell, features another of Dickens' well-known characters. A retired businessman described as a generous and affluent gentleman, Samuel Pickwick, was the founder and chairman of the Pickwick Club, written for serialized publication and later compiled and sold as one story, the Pickwick Papers tells of the club's members who travel around England by coach to examine specimens of human life in places re as uh, remote from London. In Rockwell's painting, the beloved protagonist is portrayed with an overflowing basket of holiday bounty. As a fledgling professional, fresh from his studies at New York's Art Students League, Rockwell gained entry to the publishing world at McBride, Nast, and Company. Many fiction-based assignments for children's magazines followed, including a series of five illustrations for Ralph Henry Barber's story, The Magic Football, a fairy tale of today. This was published in St. Nicholas Magazine in December, 1914. 
Despite its fantastical underpinnings, the story must have rung true for Rockwell. Principal character Billy Piper, like Rockwell, was not known for his athletic prowess, but had daydreams of being a star football player. Responding to the boy's impassioned wish, a spindly fairy, who you see here, emerges to give Billy a magic football to aid him in his quest. In Rockwell's illustration, this flight of imagination is set against a realistic setting, a well-appointed sitting room filled with books, art prints, sculpture, brushes, pens, and ink bottles. Over the mantel hang a Rembrandt-like Burgomaster and what appears to be a copy of Millet's 1857 painting, The Gleaners, featuring three women toiling over the remaining stalks of wheat in a field after harvest. At the end of the story, Billy wins the big game for his team to much acclaim, but also experiences, quote, a sorrow. The magic football is gone, indicating that next time, talent and effort alone will be his salvation. Also something that probably rang true to Rockwell. The Land of Enchantment, um, another Rockwell flight of fantasy, inspired by works of classic fiction, appeared in December 22nd, uh, in the December 22nd, 1934 issue of the Saturday Evening Post, though it was not originally intended for publication. Conceived for a commission Rockwell received from a man who wished to hang a picture over the mantle of his children's room, the project was curtailed when the financial crash of 1929 forced the client to cancel his order. But the Post encouraged Rockwell to develop the idea, his first double page spread for the magazine, which could be clipped out for framing. At the time, Rockwell lived in New Rochelle, New York, and displayed the painting in the town's library, where it continues to hang for public enjoyment, and it's actually on view uh, at the museum right now. It's really fun to have it on the walls. In this rare mural-sized painting, Rockwell contrasts the worlds of fantasy and reality by surrounding two children boldly painted in the foreground, engrossed in their books, against a paler backdrop of slowly emerging storybook characters. He further distinguishes figures from background by echoing the children's posture with two strong diagonal thrusts, subtly designed, that begin just above their heads and flow outward to the lower corners of the art. Carefully inscribed around the canvas perimeter are the names of many beloved characters from fairy tales and fantasy. From Old King Cole to Rip Van Winkle, Alice in Wonderland, Little Red Riding Hood, Robinson Crusoe, and The Cat and the Fiddle. Decades later at the post, whimsy was still the order of the day, as evidenced in the 1955 cover illustration Art Critic, which um, happily is in the Norman Rockwell Museum's collection. <clears throat> in a recurring Rockwell motif, fantasy and reality exchange places as paintings in a gallery literally come to life. Despite Rockwell's use of what is referred to in cinematography as deep focus, when foreground and background objects take on equal clarity to create a sense of hyperrealism, the artist's imagination has clearly taken the lead. Rockwell once said he envied students who swooned when viewing the Mona Lisa because he never felt such passion. Perhaps he viewed himself as a more analytical artist, like the one examining a 17th century portrait in Art, art Critic. With typical humor, he replaced the indignant woman portrayed in his charcoal study with one more alluring in the portrait frame. Uh, a Rubens, uh, Rubens inspired by a, a drawing of Peter, that Peter Paul Rubens made of his first wife, Isabella Brandt, and by Rockwell's photography of his own wife, Mary Barstow Rockwell. 
To further enliven the piece, a quiet landscape in the background has been supplanted by a group of Dutch cavaliers, which you can actually see here. He wasn't getting quite enough activity from that uh, beautiful landscape. Uh, and the cavaliers, of course, seem to express concern over the student's close proximity to the art. The lighthearted nature of this 1955 work belies Rockwell's own reality. During an emotional year, Mary uh, modeled for the painting, painting's portrait while under treatment for depression at the nearby Austin Riggs Center in Stockbridge. In addition, the couple's youngest son, Peter, was severely injured in a fencing accident at college. After four days at the hospital, Rockwell wrote with a relief, Peter out of danger. An art student at the time, oldest son Jarvis posed as the young man looking a bit too intently at the flirtatious portrait. Art critic is one, uh, one of Rockwell's most popular and extensively analyzed works. His photographer, Bill Scoville, believed that it gave him the most trouble and agony of any. He had a terrible time finishing it, he said. At least 13 different charcoal and color studies preceded the finished painting. And here you see Rockwell in his studio surrounded by all of them. Uh, remarkably uh, created just to appear on the cover of a magazine that would be on the stands for one week. Similarly themed, Rockwell's 1946 painting Framed invites the viewer to ponder what happens when patrons vacate museums and artworks are left to their own devices. In this painting, a security guard has inadvertently framed himself as impressionist and historical paintings look on from the wall behind him. Fireman also relies upon this favorite Rockwell pictorial device, utilizing a frame within a frame to convey a layered message. Published on the cover of the Post in 1944, the year after a catastrophic fire destroyed his Arlington, Vermont studio, complete with his costume reference and prop collections, Fireman plays a visual trick on the viewer. Using trompe techniques, Rockwell releases a stream of smoke from a smoldering cigar left on the mantle below to the dismay of the 1890s era firefighter who is trapped within his frame. On the lookout for props, Rockwell purchased an antique gift fr guilt frame from a dollar, for a dollar in a junk shop. It was empty, he said. I felt it had to be filled. So you see the frames in this picture and the pictures in the frame. Legends of mermaids and mermen have enchanted humans for millennia. In the journal Christopher Columbus kept during his voyage of 1492 to 93, he recorded testimony from a crew member who claimed to have seen mermaids. English explorer Henry Hudson's 1608 logbook contains a similar account. These wonders of the sea, long a staple in literature, surfaced frequently in the golden age of illustration, about 1880s to 1920s. In the works of such artists as Howard Pyle, Edmund Dulac, and Arthur Rackham, all of whom Rockwell admired, Rockwell's mermaid, a whimsical fantasy and his only nude for publication builds upon the tradition. During his student years, Rockwell sometimes escaped to the seaside resort of Provincetown, Massachusetts, where he studied with painter Charles Webster Hawthorne and took the opportunity to work directly from nature. The idea for Mermaid formed from his memories of these early experiences following his previous post cover of a prim bride-to-be and her fiance in a somber New England town hall, Mermaid with its sea breezes, white sand and rosy cheek nymph was a refreshing diversion. Walter E. Merchant, an 81-year-old Gloucester, Massachusetts lobsterman posed for the painting. 
But imagining the uh, turmoil that might ensue if a neighbor were to appear as a nude female protagonist, Rockwell wisely hired a professional model from New York. Oh, I'm sorry. For the fishtail, he purchased a 12 pound pollock from the Berkshire Fish Company and after photographing it, gave it to his neighbor, John Malumphy, who served it as his restaurant for two days. Rockwell was disappointed with the reproduction of the painting, uh, which was published uh, on August 20th, 1955, because he felt that his wispy clouds designed to give the picture a mystical effect were lost in the printing. Some readers called the cover obscene, but most found it humorous and delightful. Completely suspending disbelief, perhaps due to Rockwell's convincing portrayal, one wrote uh, and noticed an egregious error explaining, this is a quote, it is well known to all competent ma marine biologists that the species Aquahomo sapiens to which the mermaid belongs is warm blooded and mammalian in contradiction to fishes, which are neither. As would be expected, a mermaid's tail is very similar to that of any other marine mammal, such as a seal and has a smooth skin, uh, skin covered with soft fur, not scales. So um, as usual, Rockwell was being uh, corrected by his audience, which he often was. In Lunch Break with a Night, Rockwell's final narrative cover illustration for the Saturday Evening Post, the lines between fact and fi fiction are again creatively crossed. Published in 1962, when the magazine sought to present itself as a modern publication in changing times, this witty anecdotal work was a refreshing reminder of an aesthetic that has all but passed. Nestled among the mounted knights in a museum's hall of arms and armor, a weary night watchman bathed in moonlight, his feet dangling from his porch perch, takes time out for a dinner break. Little does he know that he is being warily observed by the grand horse on, whom, on whose pedestal he rests. During the American 20th century, the profusion of print media supported the work of numerous talented illustrators who in concert with the literary and commercial establishments were purveyors of imagination and fantasy. Rockwell's ability to look beyond the surface of things into the hearts, minds and imaginations of his readers offered a vision that set him apart. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I would be happy to take any questions. We have a little bit of time before we start our next um, our next uh, panel, which we're very much looking forward to. So, oh, thank you. Nice comments. I'm so glad people enjoyed that. It is really, uh, really fun and interesting to see Rockwell's forays into fantasy. I think it's something that he greatly enjoyed. Uh, I think with that, we will take a, a little bit of a break. And uh, I would suggest that we come back at 1030, which is in about seven minutes. And we will look forward to getting started with Ruth and Jane. Okay. Thank you, everybody.
Hi, Jane, it's Rich Bradway at the museum. Um, do you know how to unmute yourself? Uh, I can direct you. There's a little microphone in your Zoom window down on the bottom left-hand corner, and it's probably already muted, so if you click on it. There. there you go. You're good. All right, we'll be back in a couple minutes. Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody. We are excited to have you back. And um, looks like we've got a fantastic group, both on uh, Zoom and on YouTube and uh, across a number of virtual platforms. And people are Zooming in from all over the place. So we're so pleased about that. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to have Ruth Sanderson and Jane Yolen with us today. And uh, to give you a sense of where we're going with this panel, um, Many of today's popular fairy tales first appeared in the collections published by Charles Perrault, the Brothers Grimm, and Hans Christian Andersen. The stories, however, evolved from folklore passed down for many generations. Jane Yolen and Ruth Sanderson are with us to discuss the portrayals of fairy tales and folk tales in their work, and the antagonists who manifest themselves as tricksters, evil stepmothers, and other beings with fantastical abilities and powers, and we're gonna find out who their favorite characters are, which I'm excited about. Uh, Ruth and Jane are actually longtime friends. They have collaborated on many projects and they have brought many, many stories to life, uh, both uh, those that are retold and those that they have created personally. But their collaborations include such books as Hush Little Horsey, where Have the Unicorns Gone, and The Arch of Bone, among others. And I am very pleased to introduce them now. Best known for her illustrations of classic fairy tales, such as The Twelve Dancing Princesses, Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Goldilocks, uh, and many others, award-winning artist and author Ruth Sanderson's paintings have been published in more than 80 books. Her beautifully rendered artworks can also be found in books such as The Enchanted Wood, The Golden Mare, The Firebird, The Magic Ring, and The Snow Princess. 
In addition, Ruth is co-director of the Low Residency MFA program in children's book writing and illustrating and certificate in children's book illustration programs at Hollins University. Her recent books include the beautifully illustrated and extensively researched A Storm of Horses, the story of Rosa Bonner. And she is currently working on The Dwarf's Tale, a young adult retelling of Snow White that will be fully illustrated in Scratchboard. Her art is currently on view in our exhibition here at the museum in Enchanted. Um, and we are featuring work, a work from uh, Ruth's 12 Dancing Princesses, which we are very honored to say uh, the entire book of illustrations is in the museum's collection. Jane Yolen is a celebrated American writer of fantasy, science fiction, and children's books. She's the author or editor of more than 350 books, including The Devil's Arithmetic, a Holocaust novella, and her other works include the Nebula Award, Nebula Award winning short story, Sister Emily's Lightship, the novelette Lost Girls, Owl Moon, The Emperor and the Kite, the Commander Toad series, and How Do Dinosaurs Say Goodnight? And Jane has also collaborated on projects with each of her three children. Jane's books and story of stories and poems have been recipients of many awards, including the Caldecott Medal, Nebula Awards, Christopher Medals, and World Fantasy Awards. And she has also won the World Fantasy Association's Lifetime Achievement Award the Science Fiction Writers of America Grand Master Award, and the Science Fiction Poetry Association's Grand Master Award. Six colleges and universities have given Jane honorary doctorates for her body of work. Welcome, Jane and Ruth. We are so happy to have you with us. <laughs> I'm, del I'm delighted to be here. You're, 50, you're about 50 books off. I have over 400. <gasps> Still. Oh my goodness, Jane. Well, we thank you for that. The, the contributions that, that you have made are, are just extraordinary. Uh, we are actually going to be running some of Ruth's images in the background as we speak. But um, I guess I'll start out with a question. And that is, um, how did you each get drawn to the subject of fantasy and folklore and fairy tales? What is it about uh, those themes that have been so meaningful and interesting to you. Um, I was I was um, reading at a very young age, probably about three or four, and my parents had a um, a, a, a series called the um, something like the world the world uh, book, and I was reading all about King Arthur because that was capital A was the first in because it was alphabetically. And I fell in love with the Arthurian tales and that was my first entry into it. Thank you, Jane. How about you, Ruth? My grandmother was a librarian. So I grew up with books and a treasured um, book in, in my parents' house was uh, growing up was a big collection of Grimm's fairy tales that belonged to my father and was illustrated um, in black and white. And when I was able to read, I just read that book over and over. So yeah, I've always and loved fantasy in particular and fairy tales. Now, did each of you study formally, um, whether art or writing? And did you have a sense that this was an area that you would begin to explore? I knew early on I wanted to be a writer. I was writing in first grade. I was, you know, the class writer. By the time I got to Smith College, I became the class poet. Um, so I was always writing. But getting into children's books was by accident. And it's a long story I won't go into, but, but um, it was predicated upon a lie. An editor wrote to me and said, we hear you're the top writer at Smith College um, of your year. Do you have a manuscript you're working on? And I didn't, I had no manuscript at all, but I said I did. And then she invited me to come in two weeks and bring my manuscript with me. And I thought I can't possibly write a novel or a short story in two weeks. 
but I could write a children's book. I thought it was easy. Turns out it wasn't. <laughs> so, so yes, I, I, um, I also in first grade was, was designate, designated um, the class artist. I, I was the artist. So I drew horses, especially because I loved them and wanted one. So it was wish fulfillment. <laughs> um, at a very young age. <laughs> and, Did you ever uh, actually get your horse? I know you have horses now. Rosa. Yes. Um, it took till um, I was 13 and my parents made a deal with me. Um, I did not want to go to, to prep school. They wanted to send me to prep school and I wanted to stay with my friends in town. And so they said they would buy me a horse if I went to prep school. So oh. I did that. Yeah. Um, and I was very lucky. He was my best friend for all the years of high school. And I still kept him at my best friend's house, so I stayed connected with, with my friends. It was so great. We're looking at the screen, um, an image that you did for an original story. I was wondering if you might wanna say a little bit about The Enchanted Wood. It's just a beautiful book. So The Enchanted Wood was um, my second fairy tale. I retold The Twelve Dancing Princesses and it got good reviews for the writing as well as the art. And I felt like I, I, I wanted to create an original tale um, based on, you know, my favorite things about fairy tales. Things happen in three, there's often three brothers. It's always the youngest one who wins the day. So the motifs of fairy tales and the woods are my favorite place. I always have been, the dark woods are you know, often depicted in fairy tales. So I wanted to combine my love of fairy tales and my favorite things and create um, so almost like a personal myth, you know, and it, it has a joint hero heroine. So I wanted to do that too. So both boys and girl readers could identify with the characters in the story. You know, it, go ahead, Jane, thank you. It, it's interesting to me that Ruth and I, um, came to horses in very different ways. Um, she owned a horse, but I got to ride Lipizzana horses and train oh. on them when I was younger um, because the Spanish Riding Academy brought, um, brought horses um, across uh, over to America. Um, so that was my, my horse thing. Uh, once you've ridden a Lipizzana, you can't ride another horse well, because they're so highly trained you, you yourself become highly trained and you expect the horses, the ordinary horses to do what the lip designers can't do. But, but I, I wanted to point this out. I've seen Ruth and sat with Ruth uh, in her studio when she's working, um, partially because my whole family um, were part of her uh, group of people who posed for her. Um, and, and when you said earlier uh, in the earlier section, you talked about, about Rockwell um, either saying or being called, saying um, that talent and invention um, will be his salvation. Um, I wanted to add hard work because yes. sitting in the studio with Ruth, I see that she has talent. I see that she's I innovative. But what I also say, what you see in Rockwell's work and with the great artist's work is, is um, how without that hard work in the studio every day, um, nothing happens. And I think that people very often who are not in the field uh, think, oh, it's magic and it just, it just occurs. And it's not. The base of all art is that hard work. Certainly, you see that in Rockwell. Certainly, you see that in Ruth's work. They love what they're doing, but by gosh, it's hard work. That's actually a very important point, Jane. And, and you're right. Rockwell was basically in the studio seven days a week. And um, Ruth, I know that you are probably the same. Uh, I wonder, Jane, what is your work schedule like? Do you, as a writer, have a schedule set out for yourself where you are saying, you know, this is my writing time? I'm usually in, the, in, in my writing room at eight o'clock in the morning, um, maybe sometimes seven, and I go until about eight o'clock at night. Um, there's no such thing as a weekend. 
unless someone plans it for me or, or unless I have to go and do signings or go and do storytelling or whatever. Uh, COVID has not bothered me because I'm used to being, you know, alone in the studio. Um, uh, and, and, and I think that that's how you get to 400 books. That's how you get to 300 books. That's how you get to six books, you know, is sitting there and doing the hard work. But finding what inspires you. And I think Ruth and I, Rockwell clearly too, are inspired by stories, by the looks on children's faces when they're hearing stories, mm -hmm. uh, the transformative nature of stories. And I think that that's, uh, that's what's been the sort of ground base, that and hard work. Ruth, do you want to add anything to that? I know that you are, um, as, as Jane said, an incredibly hard worker. And uh, even just from your, your postings of your recent uh, plein air paintings, um, I can't get over what you accomplish. Cannot get over it. Yes, I, I, I'm basically, except for travel and when I'm in the house, um, I'm sort of working all the time. Uh, one has to have a very... Um, agreeable um, spouse to to put up with um, <laughs> an artist or an author I think who is sort of always part of part of you is working whether you're eating or wherever you are you're always the ideas are always churning um, and I, I I have worked seven days a week for for most of my career and now I take weekends off and do plein air painting for fun outside so I do art as a living and what do I do for fun <laughs> my, my children knew that if they saw me in my workroom with my fingers on in those days the the um, typewriter um, they would stand at the door and wait until I looked interruptible or they would go and get themselves you know a peanut butter sandwich they, they didn't need mommy to do those sorts of things so that by the time they were teenagers um, not only were they completely competent in many ways um, but they all became book people. And all my children, all three of my children have had books published. That's amazing. That's wonderful. And, and Ruth, that's the case uh, with your children as well, isn't it? Yes. Um, my younger daughter, um, Whitney, has written, uh, I think it's up to 20 books now. We have collaborated on five horse stories for Random House, which she wrote. And I illustrated um, their middle grade um actually they're chapter books and yeah she's a great author and um my older daughter morgan is also a writer and working on stories herself now and uh, i'm sure that eventually she will be published as well yes we have a joke in our family that my children um each of them has over th uh, 30 30 books published and my daughter, Heidi, um, when she's talking to groups, she says, you think I'm a big success? She said, and, um, and 30 books are, are not to, to be sniffed at. I think it's actually close to 40 now. Um, and she said, in my house, they say, aren't you, aren't you cute? <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah, there's a big, big line between 40 and 400, but 400, happened because I'm now 82. <laughs> well, and you've worked uh, pretty much every day, as you say, other than if a vacation was planned for you, I'm sure. Um, you know, an interesting question came in, and I think it is something that we wanted to touch upon a little bit in our conversation. Um, what character archetypes are you drawn to? And, um, you know, are there specific characters in fantasy or folklore or fairy tales that you like and have uh, kind of developed? My, my favorite is Baba Yaga, the great Russian witch. She loves young women and she eats the boys. <laughs> um, she's, she's, she's this, this force. Um, you can't kill her. You may bargain with her. You're not ever sure she's going to keep to her end of the bargain, but you can bargain with her. But she's just phenomenal. So I'm, I also have a tendency 
to want to rewrite many of the stories so that the girls are not just uh, someone to be passed to the highest male bidder, um, to just be married off to, to the strong young man who um, is not interested in them particularly. He wants to go do good deeds. Um, and, and so a lot of my stories um, that have folkloric elements in it uh, totally restructure uh, some of the old stories to do just that, or to point out the fallacies and the faults in the stories. Uh, all stories have faults, but, but, um, but they follow, especially folklore follows the line of what's going on in the culture of the day. And if the culture of the day is young women is to look beautiful and stay indoors and, and let the boys go off and do whatever it is they do with tilting at windmills, that's not what's going on now. So um, for me, it's finding either finding those stronger archetypes or turning some of the, of the, the archetypes that we have um, in, in, into something else. Here's an example. When I, I, was teach, I taught um, children's literature at Smith College for seven years, but I also teach it uh, a lot of time. And when I talk about folk tales, I say, let's really look at some of those old stories. You know, the, the, one, the one where the prince finds the beautiful girl in the glass coffin, pays in the story, he pays money to the, to the dwarfs to let him take the girl in the, the dead girl in the coffin back to his house. Nobody ever says, what the heck does he want with a dead girl in a glass coffin? We don't go there, but I did. And really, if one of his guards hadn't stumbled and the girl turned over and the apple came out of her mouth and she sat up, I can just see if you follow the logic of the story then, the prince says, take her back. I don't want her. She's alive. You know, so, so we don't talk about a lot of these undercurrents in these stories that we've accepted for years. And I think it's important for us to look at them, to take them apart, to put them together, maybe to turn them upside down. Uh, or if we're gonna tell them exactly the way they've been passed down to us, then know what we're doing when we do it. Jane, did you receive any resistance when you began to ask those kinds of questions of the stories that for so many years had just been absorbed and accepted? Um, the kind of resist I got a lot of, 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 oh my gosh, I hadn't thought of that kind of re response, but I did get a resistance from an interesting group of um, men um, who were folklorists who said that what I was writing was fake lore, not folklore, but fake lore. And it, you then have to ask, step back and ask yourself another question. Did the story just emerge from full on by itself with no human intervention or were these stories that were told sometimes for entertainment uh, but also at the same time for entertainment to teach the children of the day what the rules were and they were saying we shouldn't touch them these are old stories if you write anything that looks and smells and 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 feels like a folk folk tale now you're doing something wicked. Wow. Thank you. Ridiculous. Ruth, how about you? Do you have certain archetypes or characters that you feel particularly drawn to? I'm loving this, this uh, gnome here. <laughs> I don't know if you want to talk about him. Um, probably the previous one um, was actually a strong female character. So I try even when retelling, um, say even the 12 Dancing Princesses, my youngest princess ends up being the heroine but she chooses um the the gardener to marry a gardener at the end instead of the prince or one of the princes even though she's ridiculed by her sisters so you know I always do try to make the female characters in my stories um you know if it's a romantic tale like Cinderella or what have you um make them make them strong and have you know, have character and, you know, have agency and make choices for themselves. 
And in the case of the Golden Mare, this is Yelena the Fair, who is kind of a magical character. And she, she ends up very cleverly saving the day, um, you know, when, when there is um, a problem with the Sultan want, wanting to marry her. <laughs> so, yeah, and in... Um, I in, want a hat. <laughs> in, the, in, the, um, in the Enchanted Wood, um, the, the, the main character is the, the wise woman's daughter who is also very wise and, and basically tempers the, um, the male character and, and proves and lets him know that, you know, the, the staying on the path is better than, than taking up the sword, you know? So, uh, yeah, so, so I try to instill you know, strength in, in my female in my female protagonists. Yes, you always do. And I, I did want to ask you just because the, the costumes here are so um, beautifully painted and ornate. Um, I made that. <laughs> wow. I made her costume. I got, it's actually a robe I got at a, at a flea market. And um, I, I, it didn't have this fancy gold, but I, I, I invented that. But I, I made her um, a, a hat as well and you know use the russian motif um in, again it wasn't quite this fancy but but i have actually have this um this costume so i do a lot of research um, those, i have a lot of books on costumes those of us who pose have, have posed over the years you know that, that you have to climb into the most amazing assortment of 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 costumes i remember when you were doing um Oh gosh, uh, the Secret Garden, and I was two different women in the secret. The older women in the Secret Garden, and she had these elaborate, sort of Victorian outfits for these women in heavy um, wool, and it was the middle of summer. <laughs> it was impossible to breathe in them. But and then we have a couple of uh, <laughs> images of roots coming up where, where we do have portrayals of you. So we'll look forward to uh, pointing those out for sure. Was, uh, I want to ask Ruth, that wasn't Rebecca Gay, was it? Posing for that? For which one? The no, girl. no, she was, um, she was, she posed in Cinderella as the, the fairy godmother. Ah, oh, because this looks very much like Rebecca. It does. Yeah. Uh, a question came in, and I think it's an interesting one. Um, oftentimes, stories evolve over time at each telling. Are there folk tales that uh, you are particularly fond of that depict that evolution? Have you found that certain stories have changed, or that you have, or that you may have changed them? Well, Jane, you were just addressing that to some degree. I've I've done a lot of collections uh, of, of folk and fairy tales. And when I do the research to decide which stories to go in, I very often find similar stories in, in other places and decide which stories seem the most exciting tellings um, uh, and then put them, put them in. So that, that over the years I found dozens and dozens and dozens of Cinderella's and dozens and dozens and dozens of, of um, Baba Yaga type characters uh, in, just depends where, you know, where you're looking. If you look in Russia, you'll find Baba Yaga, but if you look in another country, you're gonna find a different version of it. Um, there are trickster stories all over the world. And sometimes there are Nancy trickster stories uh, from, from um, Africa, or they could be stories about Raven the trickster or Rabbit the trickster. So they're all, they're all, very often they're very similar stories, but it's fascinating. You know, Jane, just uh, in terms of what you just said, a writer just wrote in to say that Baba Yaga is the foil to Hellboy in the Hellboy graphic novel series by Mike Mignola. So I guess characters keep um, finding new stories and being reinvented in new ways. I know that because I wrote an introduction to one of, of Mike's um, graphic novel series. Oh, wow. Yeah. We're, all, we're all related. <laughs> For sure. Um, Ruth, do you want to say a little bit about what's on the screen, maybe? Oh, yes. Um, 
I think at some point we were going to talk about antagonists and yes. and this is um, the dwarf from from Rose Red and Snow White and he um, he's the only antagonist in my stories that I completely made up. Um, I did not find a model for this one. <laughs> I just <laughs> made Maybe that's him a good up. Thing. And actually, he reminds me a little of the the Rockwell piece that you showed with the. Um, you know the the gnome Magic or, football, or yes. whatever um yeah and so he was really fun fun to invent um the greedy dwarf i bet you know it, here's an interesting thing the rumble stillskin stories story um and this this picture reminds me of it too um if you think about the rumple stillskin story and this is something that i found out that i, I i've never seen it anywhere else here you have a character who's who's like a greedy dwarf, right? He has a big nose and an unpronounceable name, and he is forced to live in the outskirts of town of a, of the of the community. He's not allowed in. The only thing he's allowed to do is to trade gold or or jewels or whatever. It's the only thing he's allowed. Now, it's not a complete huge step to get from there to saying that character in folklore has consistently been consistent with, with um, uh, Jews. I'm Jewish, those kinds of characters make me very you know, nervous um, because those are the characters that you can tear apart, um, you can throw into the fire, uh, you can kick them in the rear and get them out of town because they're not in the place where they're supposed to be. But they are almost always portrayed that way. And um, it's like giants, you know, we have giants in our head and they're a certain way. Uh, dwarfs, they stand for something else. So it's interesting how over the years, these, these characters have become codified. Um, and some people see them one way, some people see them the other. Jane, do you find that some of the roots of the characterizations come from uh, prejudices against certain groups? Do you think that is an innate aspect of some of the earlier folk tales? Certainly you have the, you know, the stupid giant. So that a stupid giant you're allowed to kill. There are certain, there are certain characters in folklore you're allowed to kill. You're not allowed to kill a prince. You're not allowed to kill the king. You're not allowed to kill the beautiful, the beautiful girl. You're allowed to kill the wicked stepsisters who all, you know, are portrayed as nasty. Um, it would be interesting to spend time um, with a, a psychotherapist mm -hmm. who would look at, look at these um, stories that have come down to us. Some of the stories are simply stories um, to make sure that your kids stay on the right path. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't talk to strangers. Don't talk to wolves in the in the woods. Uh, don't um, uh, don't open your door to strangers. They're all the sorts of things that a young, well-bred or maybe not so well-bred young woman is taught in the old days. The boys are taught be brave, take your sword, go forward. God is with you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that so that this becomes a way of codifying. Um, in story, uh, what people uh, want their children to know. So a lot of times these stories are really doing double work. They're entertainment, mm -hmm. but they are also at the same time as that they're entertainment, they are teaching you the things that you as a young man or a young woman growing up needs to know to have a good life. Yes, uh, thank you, fascinating. I was wondering if you might each describe a little bit about your creative process because you, um, you know, do tremendous research and I'm wondering how you come up with ideas and you know, is there a sort of a the most exciting or most interesting aspect of your process and are there stumbling blocks along the way, things that you find to be very challenging as you're developing projects? Ruth, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, so my favorite stage of, 
of a book is actually the planning stage. Um, that's, that's the idea stage, um, the conception, the vision of uh, the book as a whole. And I always do really small thumbnail sketches um, and, and a storyboard to, or two or three, um, sometimes I do many, uh, to, to really plan the flow of a book and how it's going to look. Um, and it's always in black and white it's always um, in full value. So I plan the darks and lights and, you know, in very small, um, very small size, um, each, each double page spread is probably, you know, one or two inches by maybe four inches. And I'm just getting the essence down of, of what I want that picture to look like. And then for the next eight months or a year or two years, I have to execute my vision. <laughs> and that's actually the most difficult part is executing it and staying true to the initial vision of that. Um, and usually emotional, some kind of emotional moment um, is what I like to portray. So that, um, I guess the challenge is to try to stay true to your initial vision. And sometimes I put that storyboard right next to me when I'm, you know, when I'm working on a painting to, to try to make sure that I'm, I'm getting the same emotional impact that I felt when I was conceiving it. Speaking of emotional impact, um, this is an incredibly powerful piece. Do you, would you mind saying a little bit about this? So this is um, the 13th fairy who is the the evil one who curses um, Sleeping Beauty, uh, retold by my friend Jane here, um, lovely. And I believe um, her daughter is in the background as one of the good fairies <laughs> posing. Which one is Might she? Might be a number of good fairies. She's definitely the one um, right to the right-hand side of the evil fairy. <laughs> uh, and the woman who did my costumes, Nan Herbert from Munson, Mass, um, posed as the evil the evil fairy and a friend posed as the uh, the queen and the child so yes the emotional um, you know she, the thrust of of the curse is what I was trying to portray and and the challenge also in in designing a picture book is where are the words going to go you know do you leave a space in the art that's light or do you you know, put it in a box at the bottom. So it's always a challenge to design, um, to design stories, um, books, and then where's the gutter? Where's the where's that page uh, going to turn? And not to put anything important in in that space. So, you know, given, given that this was something that Jane uh, wrote, Jane was was what was that collaboration like? Did you discuss the story before? Uh, Ruth began the illustrations, or how did that work? Was there a lot of back and forth? <laughs> uh oh, there's a story there. Yeah. Upside down. Okay. Ruth and says, um, "My, um, I'm, I'm supposed to be doing a book uh, of um, this is um, not not Cinderella. This is Snow Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> Sleeping Beauty." Um, and they told me they were going to write the story around my pictures and they haven't done that. And, and uh, I don't know what to do. So I told them that they should call you up and have you do it. I'm just warning you that. And then they, then they called up and they wanted me to do it, but for no money. And so Ruth said, I'll give you, <laughs> I'll give you a painting or two afterwards. I said, done. And, and uh, the problem is, and, and that little orange fairy with her hand over, uh, orange, girl with her hand over her 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 bosom is my daughter uh, who is now who is now up to book 40 on um and so it's easy to retell a fairy tale if you just read it enough times and get to understand where the movement is but this one was more difficult because Ruth had painted all the paintings and Sometimes she would have a big scene, which in the book, the storytelling itself is two lines. Mm. And 
I had to reinvent new parts to the story to stretch it out um, in, in order to fill the space that she'd left for, for, the, for the story itself. So it was, it was a, a more difficult project than it, it would have been if we had done it the other way around where I had written it first and then she illustrated it. Mm -hmm. The pictures were so stunning, you know, you had to just keep going. Yeah. Which really are stunning, but I guess did that uh, mean that you were kind of filling in uh, areas that had not yet been invented, Jane? That's right. I mean, I remember I, I, I had a whole section on on the spiders uh, that had spin their webs <laughs> all over the place when the girl was sleeping. I, I think that's right, isn't it, Ruth? It was a long time ago. I don't remember exactly, but I do remember you did a wonderful job um, filling in. Yeah, the, the spaces I left were text. It's like, I just estimated, you know? <laughs> and yeah, sometimes you probably didn't have enough room and had to be really quick. And then other times, yes, yeah. there was a lot of space and you were um, stretched to expand that part of the story. You know, the funny thing is I look at, I look at these pictures that Ruth has done and 40 years ago when we first met, um, I probably would have written a poem about the horse um, or the man. But these days, writing as an 82-year-old, I might write a poem from the point of view of the, um, of, of the, the, the bush and the brush here that is keeping people out. Mm. I think that as we get older, these stories take on different aspects to us and for us. And um, uh, we're never seeing them completely with the innocence uh, that we first saw when we, were, when we were children ourselves. And I think that's another reason why I, I feel that, you know, people choose to novelize fairy tales because there's so much essence there. And, and like Jane said, you might want to take the point of view of a different character. And in my case, you know, I've always loved um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, but um, I, I want to retell it from a dwarf's point of view. And the only way I can do that is to write a novel, so. Yeah. yeah. And that's what you're actually working on now, Ruth, isn't it? Yes. I've been and on it and for scratch a board, uh, I know you're so proficient in as a painter, but also in that uh, scratch board medium, which I wish we had an example here. They're quite extraordinary. Would you want to say a little bit about that project? So, well, I fell in love with Scratchboard in particular um, when I wanted to illustrate The Golden Key, which was a Victorian fairy tale by George MacDonald. And then since then, I've been doing a lot of work, a lot of work in Scratchboard and it sort of took over for a while. And and yes, I, I the, um, you know, I guess I, I never really took to the Snow White story. You know, I've never retold or illustrated it um, as a picture book, um, but I have read other versions, um, novelized versions, and, and I just got an idea that perhaps it was a dwarf that made the magic mirror for the queen. And what, you know, what would be the consequences of that when he discovered um, what she was going to do with it and what she did with it because he becomes friends with the Snow White character. So it's been, um, it's been a long time in the making. I kind of work on it um, here and there, but I'm determined to finish it uh, by the end of this year. It's very close. So, but then, but then I have to illustrate it. <laughs> right. It might be another few years. So. I did a Snow White um, novel. Um, and, and yes, I love it. At it's the problem with novelizing is you can't, you can't just sit with that small, small little, um, um, uh, very tight story anymore. You have to, you have to embrace it and you have to enlarge it, which means you're, you're finding new characters that haven't been in, in, uh, um, the books before, or who haven't started them before and and it it uh, it has all of the problems that a novel has just a plain everyday novel 
but you're but you've got these characters who have always been sort of um, uh, stand-ins for other things, for other for for this one is the good guy, this one is the bad guy, kind of thing, and 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 it takes a lot of work to do that kind of a novel, and then Ruth, that you're going to illustrate it as well, <laughs> it gives me heart attack. <laughs> It might be my final project. It might take me another forever till the end of time. <laughs> I doubt it, Ruth. You're just going to have to go off on another painting excursion to take a break once, after that. Once I finish the text, um, the, the pictures will grab me. I just really need to finish the story first. It's funny because in picture books, I often will work both ways. And I've done a few sketches for this, but I, I really need to do... Um, to finish the story first. And and yes, as Jane said, you know, the archetypal, you know, evil stepmother, I, she, you know, I can't make her a cardboard character. I, I've got to give her depth and a reason why she wants to kill, you know, her, uh, you know, her stepdaughter. So it gets okay. dark, it, you know, it, it has turned into a, a young adult story, mm -hmm. not, not a middle grade mm -hmm. story. Start. You know, there's a question from the audience, which is um, very interesting. How do you relate to a younger generation? And do you have to think differently about your stories based upon, you know, maybe when they're created and who they're created for? Or, or are you really just creating your story first and then it finds its own audience? I talk to my grandchildren. I mean, I, I I have six grandchildren and they each have a variety of interesting and some of them outrageously outspoken ideas about what I should be doing. Nana, you can't do that anymore. Nana, you can't say that anymore. What would be an example of something they said you could not say or maybe write about? Well, I think just making someone evil without without why, or, or making making a girl ugly and that makes her bad, that sort of thing. Um, but also, they're giving me all the time stories of themselves um, and what they're doing. I have I have grandchildren who are. Um, I have one grandson and the rest are granddaughters, but the grandson is, is the most um, sort of outrageously wonderful of the group. And I have one granddaughter who is, um, is um, uh, her pronouns are um, we, us, they. You know, so I'm learning all of these things that I might not have otherwise learned um, because I love my grandchildren and they are also wonderful and interesting and and uh, will tell me if they don't like what they see in my writing. And in fact, I've written books with two of them now. And each time I'm very careful to listen exactly to their critiques because if you're writing with someone else, you listen to them very carefully. And they are right there in the now where yeah. I'm not. I'm yeah, very exciting to actually work with them on projects. Mm -hmm. Ruth, how about you? Do you have that sense of the audience you're speaking to particularly, or do you shift your point of view based upon that? No. <laughs> yeah. I, I I'm writing and illustrating what I love. And I, I guess I just hope that other people um, uh, react react to it. Uh, I guess in the in the case of fairy tales, I'm trying to do, you know, sort of a timeless, a timeless look. Um, and yeah, I hope that hope that it appeals. Um, my my uh, now that you're showing this piece. Um, over the years, uh, young women have contacted me saying, you know, they read the 12 princesses as, you know, when they were growing up and the images just stayed in their mind and now they're getting married <laughs> and they are actually designing the, the wardrobes of their, 
their wedding party um, based on on my costumes for wow. from from the twelve dancing princesses. Um, in fact, what, there was one woman who wanted me wanted to fly me to down to Florida to do a painting of herself in one of the dresses and her husband. And at the time, I was just too booked up, and I I I could not do it. So, wow. So that 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 has happened um, many times that that the images, even though they're 15th century costumes, you know, I've just appealed to the imagination of of um, of young young girls and women and stick stick with them. They stick with them. And you did design and sew these costumes. Oh no no no. No, I did no. the I okay. did uh, the Snow Princess, but I I worked with a customer um, from Munson yes. who was a professional okay. customer, and she she did costumes for the local summer theater. So uh, many of the most of these costumes um, we just borrowed from the wardrobe that that they had, um, and she made she did make the youngest princess costume, and she was so knowledgeable. Um, in fact, I I often over the years conferred with her on on uh, costume design. She created all the hats, which, you know, they're not all the, the princess cone hat. You know, in the 15th century, they, they had all these different types of hats. So that's why the princesses are not generic. They, they are, you know, all individuals. I want to have, well, I could no longer wear it, but I want to have the, the costume that's the turquoise one on the left. That, that the what? The turquoise costume on the left of the pictures. Oh, yes, that's beautiful. With the drop, the that drop. would look great on you, Jane. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, um, um, I'd love to ask uh, what you both feel are the most important factors in creating a great painting or narrative. Are there particular things that a story or illustrated story should have? Um, to have impact. Gorgeous language, truth, and a forward motion. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think um, in, in, in many pictures or, or scenes, um, it's important to have an emotional, to portray an emotional moment, connection. I mean, not in every scene, but um, to always have that um, that element so that the reader can uh, can empathize and put themselves into into the story and you know I use color to create mood you know that's I feel that's important too so each of my pictures has a has a color scheme that I create I often just work from black and white reference photos and create my own my own colors and you know color color creates mood and in um it's interesting you were talking about um, Rockwell's uh, idea that pathos plus a little humor sticks. And that really struck me. And I realized that in many of my retellings, I, I actually have added a little twist of humor at the end that feels right for the story. It's maybe a little bit of a modern sensibility that I've added to some of the stories and just change the ending a little. Um, and yeah, that, that, that little addition of humor um, when there's a serious <laughs> subject is important. Speaking of humor. <laughs> Speaking of humor. Can anybody guess why Jane is laughing? So, yes, the wise woman, also one of my favorite archetypal characters. Um, and Jane is the archetypal wise woman <laughs> in real life as well as as a model. <laughs> Ruth, how did you re recruit Jane to uh, become your model for this character? Oh gosh, Jane loves to model. She just, I think she's modeled for every artist that she, <laughs> if they're close, <laughs> she loves to model. Um, it doesn't- It's, it's the clothes, Ruth. <laughs> <It's> the clothes. <laughs> so Ruth Rockwell would um, give very particular directions. He, he's, he once said that if he hadn't been an illustrator, he would have been a movie director. So he would give each model very, very specific directions on how to pose, how to express, you know, create expression. Is that something that you do as well? 
Absolutely. In fact, I, you know, those little <laughs> uh, thumbnail illustrations I was talking about, you know, I take them, you know, when I do a photo shoot, you know, if there's a number of different models, um, I'll take those little sketches that, you know, I just make out of my head and, and then I position the people, um, you know, in, in the scene, you know, based on, um, based on my little sketches and then tell them what's going on and try to get them to, um, to emote a little emotionally in the photo. Um, it's a little easier with adults to do that. Sometimes, you know, if it's a young child, um, it can be a little, a little tricky, but for, for the most part, um, you know, I, I use um, children, I think maybe Rose Red and Snow White or Goldilocks might've been the youngest children I used, but, but they were all very accommodating and tried, <laughs> tried to get into the scene. It is like directing a movie, you know, mm -hmm. still shots. It's like, you know, you're choosing 15 still scenes from a movie and you want that, you do want that emotional moment. My, my granddaughter, uh, Madison, um, who is, I've done two books with and is now in law school. She did a lot of modeling for, for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, she loved it. She loved doing it. I think that this picture for me, it's the connection between the two, one sleeping and one not, but you feel that they have made a connection somehow. And I think it's, I think it's between, it's what's going on between them, not, not uh, anything else. It's almost as if he knows she's there, but he's not speaking yet. He's not talking. Mm -hmm. Looking and saying, <coughs> maybe I should just hit him with the stick. <laughs> <laughs> Looks yeah. like that's about to happen, actually. Uh, we have a nice comment from Alice Carter, who spoke last night. Um, Thanks, Jane, for the great advice, gorgeous language, truth, and forward motion. So greatly encapsulated. Um, I'm wondering, while you are working, do you ask for advice or comment um, on a piece as your story progresses, or is that something that you would prefer not to? And I, 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 I sort of interrupt my question. Is this Jane also up in the upper right? Right hand corner, Ruth, as mother. Yeah, this is Jane behind me as well. That's the original painting. Yes. Back, back there. I thought it would, it yep. happened to be in my, in my cabinet. So it's I really wonderful. pulled it out. <laughs> that is Jane. Oh. And that's my magical mother goose. You know, I had to add fairies and elves to my mother goose, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's a beautiful painting. The oh. elves are keeping house for, for mother goose. <laughs> they had me sitting on, um, on a the arm of a of a uh, an easy chair, um, so that she could spread my my the back. It looked so it would look like it, we were flying. Oh, that's fun. Okay, that fun. did you have the costume on? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the costume isn't always exact. It sort of simulates, and then yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll um, alter it a little bit. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, so actually, do you ask for advice or comment or do you prefer to get through a project and then, you know, kind of put it out there? Hmm. Uh, both, both ways, both ways. I have um, a writing group that I am uh, I'm in contact with every uh, once a week, uh, on our good days once a week. During COVID, we were Zooming a lot, um, all with women who are professional children's book writers. Um, but my daughter lives next door and I can always ask her to read something if, if I'm a little weary or wary about it. Um, and she, she pulls no punches. She just tells me, <laughs> but I'm the same with her. She asked me to read her stuff too. That's great. How about you, Ruth? Do you tend to like to move through something before checking in with people? Well, in terms of writing, I, I certainly share that. Um, and the novel, of course, you know, I'm, I'm showing a lot of people and getting a lot of different advice um, because that's, that's new for me. Um, but of course you work, um, when you're doing a book, you work with an editor who gives you feedback and also, you know, an art director who, who often gives you feedback. So, um, but then once they approve, um, you know, sketches, uh, then, 
in terms of paintings, um, I usually don't a ask advice in the middle of a painting. No, I, I pretty I have a pretty strong vision in illustration where I want to go, and then it's just um, great, great guns <laughs> going ahead yeah. to execute to execute it. Yeah. Do we have a question from, um, I'm sorry, Jane, did you want to pipe in there a little bit? Yeah, Ruth has a long history of being one of the fastest painters I know. Um, she used to be able to yes. push out um, these gorgeous Renaissance looking paintings uh, in two or three days. I think she slowed down a little bit to maybe a week. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's always been we're in the same, I, I helped start a group of um, called Western Massachusetts Illustrators Guild and where they show their stuff. And she always seems to have a new painting to show uh, or paintings to show. Yes. Um, it's, so. it's, those, it's those seven days a week. And yeah, this one probably took me uh, three weeks, Jane. <laughs> so they're not all fast. It depends on the complexity of, of the scene. Uh, the, my recent biography of Rosa Bonheur, um, I have an 80 hour painting. It's, um, you know, and that's over a number of weeks, not, not just two. Um, yeah, because I, I often work on multiple things at once. So it's hard to judge exactly yeah. um, how many hours, but um, I did log my hours for this, that particular project. And sometimes it'll take me 20 hours just to compose, to compose a picture before I even start painting. So. Um, it, again, it depends on complexity. Mm -hmm. And yes, occasionally I have done paintings in three days. <laughs> we have a question from the audience, actually from uh, our director, Laurie Norton Moffat, uh, who writes that beloved illustrator, Jerry Pinckney, who many of you may know, uh, actually passed away very unexpectedly this week uh, and who will be so greatly missed. Um, retold many classic tales, casting characters as persons of color to make them more accessible to young children of color. Have either of you rewritten classic tales and illustrated them to decenter whiteness and make them more accessible to children and parents of color, or maybe created uh, other unique stories um, for that purpose? Um, I think both of us um, have, I, my, um... My stories, of course, I don't illustrate. So, um, but I have in the various books over the years, uh, when I did collections, I always was very careful to try to have stuff from everywhere. Uh, people of color, people, but, but it's a little, um, these days a little, uh, you have to be careful because own voices means that if you're not that person, um, you have to be extraordinarily careful or knowledgeable to use um, someone else's story in, in your story. So um, that's, that's right now we're in that tipping point. Um, but if you look at my, my collections, especially, there are stories from Africa, from India, from um, the southern borders, um, from China, from Japan, from Korea, um, in, indigenous people's stories from all over the world. Uh, but in that case, very often I will not retell them. I will, I will tell them as, I will present them as told from within the, from within the culture. Yes, thank you, Jane. But those are important points. Um, Ruth, any thoughts about that? Sure. Um, I mean, in general, my fairy tales have been, you know, Western um, fairy tales. So I'm I'm sticking with the tradition of, you know, of the um, the ethnic group that the fairy tales are originally told in. Mm -hmm. um, my my recent um, the book I just finished, which will be out in March, the biography of Rosa Bonheur. I did a lot of research on, you know, who would be who else would be, might be in the pictures in the background. She obviously was French. So, I, you know, I'm depicting her as close as possible to, to how she looked, but there were horse handlers um, that are black um, and a, a, a lot of African um, presence in, in the backgrounds of, of the illustrations and street scenes, museum, what have you. So, um, because there was a, a big presence in in Paris at that time, 
Um, so I wanted to, to show that. I even put um, Dumas, the, the author who, who has Haitian descent, he wrote The Three Musketeers. He's actually in the final picture looking at her painting of the horse fair because he was there in 1850. Um, he was in Paris. And so I thought, well, he probably went to that, that exhibit where the horse fair was shown. So, so I have him sitting on a couch in the background. I have to say that those originals are just absolutely amazing. Ruth um, was kind enough to bring them to the museum to show us uh, when she was here during uh, the summer our sculpture competition and the research and the detail are just amazing. When does that book come out, Ruth? It should be out in March. Um, however, the boat situation I know um, is, is a little problematic right now and I don't know how it will be next year. I do know a few people that um, were supposed to have book launches and the books didn't come in. So um, hopefully by March and that is the 200th anniversary of Rosa Bonner's uh, birth. So that's when we wanted um, the book about her life to come out and about her painting of horses <laughs> here. That will be she painted um, the horse fair, which is the largest painting of horses you will ever see. <laughs> it's been hanging at the Metropolitan Museum of Art since the late 1800s mm -hmm. and it's eight by 16 and a half feet wide. And I wanted to know how did a woman in 1850 do this? <laughs> so that's what my story yeah. is about, basically. Yeah, it's uh, quite remarkable. Thank you. Well, I have two examples up on the screen of uh, books that you have both collaborated on. I I'm just wondering if you might tell us a little bit about these and maybe where the ideas came from and how you decided to work together. Um, both of them were very different. Uh, I wrote, Where Have the Unicorns Gone? And then we asked Ruth to do it. She wanted to do um, a lullaby book uh, of horses. Um, and I think it was going to be a board book. Ruth, is that, tr is that true? Am I remembering that right? Hmm. Uh, no, they, they turned it into a board book. But um, no, I, I think it was originally um, a picture book. Picture book. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, Ruth and I discussed that one um, and, and then I wrote it in rhyme. I guess they're both written. They're both in rhyme. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, Where Have the Unicorns gone, gone came to Ruth fully fledged, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Jane, what, what is it about unicorns? That, do, do you have a particular love of that type of, of character? Oh, absolutely. You know, they're horses on steroids. <laughs> and only girls can tame them so you know I mean come on that's a gimme Ruth wow uh, there's a beautiful series in, that you've um, we're going to be passing through from that book would you want to say a little bit about these so uh, I tried to do something a, a bit different with this book um, it's so evocative and you know you know unicorns are magical they're, they're kind of almost your archetypal. So I, um, I did a really a different technique where I, I made a texture with a palette knife on the surface that I was working on. And then I kind of glazed over it. So in the corner here, you can sort of see in, in the waves, there's sort of, it's very textural. So I, I, I played with, with that a lot and um, and this actually was the original cover and what you saw was um, was the paperback cover. This was um, the wraparound of the original hardcover cover. So it was more symbolic and evocative. It's absolutely beautiful. And I think we have another coming up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just love Jane's poem, how, you know, it's like taking unicorns through time and, and each time, um, you know, they go down to a body of water and they go down to the pool, the hidden pool, or I, I can't remember, um, I should have the book so I can read the lines because they were just so beautiful. So I wanted to, to, to have my paintings um, as evocative as possible to mirror Jane's um, wonderful evocative text. The last page. There's one more. He has a picture ah, of there, yeah. Oh, I, I happen to own this painting and I love it. Oh and boy, it's amazing. 
you if you look carefully, you can see the unicorns within the water. Right. And you can also see that, um, you know, a little bit that palette knife texture is still there, is is underneath the um, the painting. But the translucency your... of those of the water, um, just amazing, beautifully done. Thank you. I was just at the beach in, in Newport, Rhode Island, and I was mesmerized. Um, there was a, a place at, on the cliff walk where um, yesterday morning it was just so windy and the waves were just exploding. And I hadn't been to a place like that on, on the shore for many, many, many years. And, and it reminded me of, of my, this painting of the unicorns. And, and now I just want to paint ocean pictures <laughs> and put <laughs> unicorns in them again. So you might see those um, coming up. We'll see okay. if I have time. I look forward to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I guess maybe a, a, a last question uh, to ask you is, you know, what, what motivates your work and what aspect of your work have you found most rewarding or, or is there a project that you are particularly proud of? The next one. <laughs> the next one, that's what Rockwell used to say, yes. I, once I have finished with something, I mean, I'll still read it at, 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 at visits with schools or whatever, but I'm on to the next. I'm always, and I write a poem a day that I send out to over a thousand subscribers and many of them are fantasy poems. Um, and it's, it's just, what's gonna to happen today? What is the new thing today? I think if I weren't interested in that next thing, that new thing, mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't be still writing. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. That keeps you moving forward. As you said in your, in your earlier statement, Ruth, how about you? Actually, I, I think I think almost the same. I, I am I am looking forward. We are we are driving our own lives um, and you know our own personal myths and our you know what what we want to accomplish and and we are moving forward and looking forward um, and and that way um, yeah that's that's the motivation is is kind of what what's next what's the next um, What's the next idea? What's the next vision? What, you know, what do I want to, what else do I want to say um, in art or in writing? Um, but but I, 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 I have to say, um, you know, you're showing Arch of Bone here. This was such an, an incredible um, opportunity to illustrate Jane's book, which is coming out in just a few weeks, Jane. Is that correct? I, I think it's coming out in, in November. Um, and again, I hope it makes it on the boat here before Christmas. Um, but, um, you know, Jane retold, well, not retold, but sort of a con continuation of, of the story of Moby Dick. And it, it, it just a, um, a wonderful fantasy, um, fantasy story for middle grade readers. And um, I illustrated in Scratchword, it's really only my second book that um, for, for children that I've illustrated in Scratchboard. So, I'm really excited by. Um, um, they I, are you know. stunning pictures, stunning. Mm -hmm. And Jane now has three of the pictures. <laughs> That's um, exciting. I'm also a collector. Um, th the book starts with a young boy, a young man. Um, uh, the, it's 1864. There's a knock on the door. It's early morning. He lives on Nantucket. Nobody comes to the door at you know, at, at that a time, his mother's been sick for much of the year and his father's off on a whaling voyage that is long overdue. And he opens the door and he sees a man he's never seen before. And he says, who are you? And the man says, call me Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And we're in Moby Dick territory. Mm -hmm. his father was the, um, was Starbuck, who was the, um, the second in command, who did not have enough wherewithal to tell the tell the sailors that he was taking over the ship uh, because because the um, uh, the captain had gone bonkers and was going to kill them all, which he did. Um, and so the boy then runs off with his dog into the 
in a in a boat into a storm and and um, is marooned on an island. So we're we're to we go from Moby Dick to Robinson Crusoe in about six chapters. Wow, it's wonderful, it's just wonderful. But they wanted to do they wanted to have some pictures in it, and they showed me um, some ideas that that they had, and they were kind of yeah. I said you need to look at Ruth Sanderson's work. Mm -hmm. She's scratch board now, and the scratch board will bring you right back to that period, right back to that time, yes. and, and and will pop because Scratchboard pops in a way that that uh, just black and whites don't. And they took one look at her work and they went, oh my God, we want her. And she worked incredibly fast to get it in time. Yes. So COVID shut everything down. <laughs> I'm supposed to be giving um, uh, a reading, uh, an in-person reading at the the um, Mystic, um, um, Mystic Connecticut um, um, uh, Seaport Museum. The, the Seaport Museum yeah. on November 6th. And we don't know if the, the book's gonna be here. Oh, so frustrating. Oh, oh, oh. Well, I think you've got to do it anyway, right? <laughs> but I, I love the, the Neil Gaiman uh, quote here. Jane Yolen is a phenomenon, a poet and a myth maker who understands how old stories can tell us new things. Oh, and I think you have uh, both done that for so many people. And it has actually been just such an honor and a pleasure to speak with you today. And I thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know everybody online enjoyed it. We have so many uh, laudatory comments and um, we can't thank you enough for being here today, but also for your body of work, which has, uh, just brought so many important stories to light. Thank you. Thank you thank so you, Stephanie. much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. So uh, thank you everyone for being with us. We are going to take a short break and then at 12 p.m. in about 15 minutes uh, or maybe a couple more than 15, but um, 12, 15, so at 12 p.m. we will be back here with uh, Victor and I, Justin Gerard and Ian McCaig. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.
Hello, hello, folks. Hello, it's good to see you. You too. Good hello. morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back, everybody. And hello, Victor and Justin and Ian. We are thrilled to have you with us. And uh, we are just going to start with a, a little introduction of everybody because our, our next panel is called The Making of Myths. And um, we're very, very honored and pleased to have Victor and I Justin Gerard and Ian McCaig with us uh, to talk about this. But uh, just a little background. So Greco-Roman sculptures of mytho mytho mythological figures carved thousands of years ago expressed the power of the gods and of the myths themselves. These ancient tales have been favored subjects of poets, storytellers, sculptors, painters, and illustrators throughout history and into modern times. Our panelists will discuss their interest in mythology and approaches to portraying capricious gods and other figures who entice humans to perform impossible tasks. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the artists. Born in Hong Kong, Victor and I studied art at the Rhode Island School of Design. And in her career, she has won numerous awards and accolades from her peers for her bold color palette and inventive designs. In 2018, Victor was the recipient of the Spectrum Gold Award for book illustration and was awarded the Advertising Gold Medal from the Society of Illustrators the following year. She has illustrated advertising campaigns for McDonald's, Apple, Johnny Walker, American Express, and numerous other companies. Justin Gerard's fantasy paintings exhibit a bold color palette, inventive composition, and terrific wit inspired by the artworks of Arthur Rackham, Palmer Cox, Maxfield Parrish, and the golden age of illustration illustrators. The works of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis have remained constant sources of inspiration for him throughout his career. His clients have included the Jim Henson Company, Warner Brothers, Harper Collins, and Random House, among many others. And his work has been featured in Spectrum, the best in contemporary fantastic art, 
and the Society of Illustrators Annual of American Illustration. Over the past 30 years, Ian McKaig has designed concept art, storyboard art, and designs for several blockbuster movies. He began his career in cinema, creating artwork for Terminator 2, Judgment Day, Hook, and Interview with the Vampire. In 1999, he was hired as a principal designer for the three Star Wars prequel films, as well as the more recent Star Wars movies. He has also created concept art and design for the Spiderwick Chronicles, John Carter, The Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, Avengers, Infinity War, and others. Welcome, we are so happy to have you with us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You forgot to mention I was a stormtrooper in Empire Strikes Back. Oh yeah. my gosh, I somehow missed that fact. I did not yeah. realize that. <laughs> that's a pretty amazing fact. Yeah, that's so cool. Very uncomfortable costumes. <laughs> oh, I was, was going to ask, were you able to breathe? Uh, they just couldn't hear. Oh you know, they'd, they'd yell action, I'd be waiting. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd tell you where to go and you can't, no wonder those guys can't shoot. You can't see yeah. anything in those helmets either. <laughs> Well, they look cool, so that's what it matters. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're going to be, uh, you know, asking some questions here, but we invite our viewers to uh, put their own questions into the chat or the Q&A, and uh, we will bring them forward. And what we'd also like to do is to um, kind of stream some images in the background of the amazing work that these artists have done. And... Um, we'll be able to stop along the way and ask them a little bit more about, um, about what they created. So um, I might just start with uh, a question for all of you. And um, you know, how did you become interested in storytelling? Uh, were illustrated books important to you as children? Were you, um, you know, encountering works of art? What, what was it and how did you get there? Uh, I can go first. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I started drawing kind of by accident. Um, my family moved around a lot. I actually attended like six different kindergarten. Um, because of that, I didn't have any friends, sadly, in my childhood. And my oh. parents were both very busy working um, parents. And I, I will go to my mom's office after school. And um, she was the editor at a newspaper company. And then all she had a layer around were paper and pen. Um, so that was what I did. I started drawing to kill time and to entertain myself. Um, and that's how I started the journey. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess because there weren't any kids around my age to play with, I started inventing you know, friends on paper that I will go to adventures with. Um, and I guess that's my you know, early entry into the fantasy realm. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. And I, since we have this beautiful piece on the screen, I wonder if you would want to comment upon this. Sure, yeah. Um, this piece is actually about uh, reserve savings for like a financial magazine, believe it or not. Um, so it's about being resor uh, resourceful and uh, save up for, you know, the harsh, days, um, especially, you know, for family. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very honored to be invited, but I also feel like kind of an imposter on this Aww. panel because a lot <laughs> of the work, you know, I do are actually uh, for, like not for fantasy clients, um, but I think fantasy just become like a language that I, I like to use to tell story and to solve solutions. Thank you, absolutely beautiful. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, Justin, would you like to talk about your beginnings in storytelling and uh, tell us how you got involved? Sure. I, I actually, I wouldn't be able to pinpoint a time that, that uh, you know, that got me started on, on this path. Safe to say that my story is probably similar to Victo's uh, in that uh, parents moved around a lot and ended up, uh, you know, hanging out by myself, just drawing quite a bit. And uh, in a similar situation, my grandmother worked at a print shop and sent me a box of paper one year. Wow! And so for an entire summer, all I did was was draw. And I, I don't remember much of those drawings. I mean, they're all terrible. But 
and they've long since been burned, uh, as is my <laughs> yearly ritual to, to burn anything that doesn't sell. No. Um, but I do no. remember, I remember there were a few that like really, I, I felt that this was it, uh, that this was the thing I had to do for the rest of my life after having drawn it. I, I remember one in particular where I, I drew, it was a tiny little fish swimming in a giant sea. And there's a little, and then I drew a bigger fish after that fish. Then there was a, even a more giant fish after that fish. <laughs> and there's, you know, this, this sort of, this tragedy of, of nature and life about to t uh, transpire here. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, I drew a tiny little alligator diving in between to intervene <laughs> between all of this to save the little tiny bright colored fish. And he was going to die. He was going to be killed. It was for certain on in my crayon scribbling there. And uh, uh, but there was there was something beautiful about that. And and then up in the right corner of the paper, I had scribbled a sun, and that <laughs> sun was beaming hearts down on on the, uh, the alligator, so that his sacrifice had not gone unnoticed by by the great tragedy of nature. I remember uh, not sure what had just happened when I had made it, but knew that this was it. Whatever this is. I'm going to find this in my future. And this is gonna, I'm gonna have this with me. I need this as part of my life from for here on out. That's wonderful. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it, and this is this amazing apocalyptic scene. Can you say a little bit about it, Justin? Um uh yeah, I I have to thank um the people who've kind of supported me on, on Patreon and Twitch for this. Um I during the the pandemic kind of didn't know what to do with myself like many of us i guess like who had been interacting with our friends and our community our tribe in many ways um at conventions and shows and galleries and then suddenly we're not allowed to um and uh we're stuck at home and uh probably spinning our wheels losing our minds and so i started doing more online stuff and, and this was part of it um doing just painting and talking to people uh, who are watching while live streaming. Um, and so I can't say much about what the story is here other than this is probably just me processing, uh, you know, emotions that were going on during that time as we kind of were all getting used to this new, yeah. new normal in the world that was. Um, and, uh, and anyway, I was having fun kind of just, uh, painting with, with like-minded people online. And this is one of the products of it. Wow, that's really wonderful. So you were painting and live streaming at the same time. Uh, yeah, I, I've I, ever since the pandemic started, I I felt that I I I was missing that element of community mm -hmm. that I had had before, and so this was kind of my way of uh, approximating it. And now that we're even coming out of the pan pandemic a bit, and and people can start to get back out and go to these shows again, thankfully. I'm still probably going to keep doing it. I, I find right. that it's, it is actually a very enjoyable thing and perhaps it is going to be part of the, the world moving forward that uh, we are a little more interconnected online. I mean, this, what we're doing today is a great example of it, that we're able to, to reach uh, our community uh, and interact with our community in this way. I think it's wonderful. Absolutely. We are so fortunate to have hundreds of people online and we would not have been able to do that if we were just live. So you're right, that's one of the great advantages of this format. Ian, welcome. Um, tell, tell us how you got started in, in sort of moving towards art and fantasy uh, themes. Love to, love to hear about that. It's, it's a little different. We, we moved around maybe every three or four years and then settled in Canada. My parents are from up here. And I, was, uh, I did most of my first things in the town that I live in right now. Um, I disappeared for 30, 40 years. It took me to get back here to actually buy a house and, and this is home though. Um, but I've never, I've never been in just one place. The pandemic is the first time that I've not traveled in a year. Um, I work where the films are. I work where London, in London or in Australia or LA or San Francisco or wherever it happens to be. And um, wherever I go, I end up in a room like this one and in front of a drawing board and when you're drawing, you're never alone. You're there with a host of characters and they're noisy and crazy. And usually for me, it, I love to stagger outside the studio and just see nature and see real people again. Um, so 
not a lot has changed for me, actually. I'm still in a room like this. I still stagger out and see nature. And I'm very, very lucky in Victoria because it was, it's kind of been like New Zealand on the island here. We haven't had a lot of cases. People have <clears throat> always masked up and been very careful and stuff. So we're able to see each other on the streets and walk through the woods and all those things. And so um, it, the, the horrible thing is standing this far away from the rest of the world and watching the terrible things that are happening, the catastrophes are happening everywhere because the pandemic is, it is, it is up there with the worst of mythological nightmares. Mm -hmm. And to be outside the window, watching that happen to all the people you love, it's been hard. Um, Very true. How, how I started drawing was just, uh, I wasn't going to be an artist ever. I didn't take art in school until quite late. I just assumed everybody drew, right? Because the <clears throat> first thing I remember is holding a pencil. I think my dad was trying to write an exercise book for men, women, and children, little children, wow. in, the, in the 50s and 60s. And nobody, women didn't exercise back then as far as the bodybuilding world was mostly concerned. So this was a groundbreaking book. What made it really groundbreaking is he's, um, he wanted everyone to be wearing kilts because <laughs> he's very Scottish wow. and I was raised you know <clears throat> playing in a bagpipe band and I wore a kilt and I highland dance over swords and things like that so nobody would illustrate it so he had to teach himself to draw and I was I was three and I would hide under his drawing board and curses and pencils and paper would <laughs> rain down from above as he tried to teach himself <clears throat> and all these art books everywhere because um, he didn't know where to start. So I had all these things and I would just look at them and copy them, draw them. And I think that's how I, I started. Um, but again, since dad was doing it and I was doing it, I assumed everybody did it. So my great love was books. And I read, I still do, I read voraciously. Um, it doesn't need to have pictures because I do the pictures. Mm. And the reason I love books so much is my head fills up with images and then I run to a piece of paper and pour them out before my head blows up. And I think that's really where it all came from. For years and years and years, I was just this illustrator of everything I read. <coughs> Sorry, oh. losing my voice, just a sec. And we've got a very famous character on the screen. Oh, he was, about this? I drew him long before the Gandalf from the films. Mm. Um, and that, again, it was like Justin was saying, I just did this for fun. This is for a birthday card for my daughter. Mm. There's a little little golem in the corner going, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But, but I was going to say, and Victor, it's, it was about your image as well, that it doesn't really matter what it's for, right? My mythology and fantasy and all this, it's just a, a wonderful costume we get to put on real life. And you get to talk about some really dark and serious and, and uplifting and wonderful things. You know, strong emotion makes us back away anyway. Mm -hmm. But if you put these costumes on, people stay because they're entertained mm -hmm. and they're, they're delighted too. They just have to get closer and see what is that? And so you can talk very intimately about all kinds of things. That's what fairy tales were for. Yeah. You know, they were, that's mm -hmm. why they're going into woods and meeting horrible wolves and fighting terrible giants. Is, those right. were realities to the people yes. back then. Absolutely. So, and they, we still have those realities. We still have all those terrifying things. Um, the the strange thing for me is that a long time ago, fairy tales were for everybody. You know, you the family would go watch a, a hanging and then they would come and sit around the fire and they tell stories. Um, today, we're very protective of what we call childhood. <clears throat> and we don't let them see certain things. They don't talk about certain things. And it doesn't feel, doesn't feel right to me because um, kids experience darkness just as much as we do um, and understand it even less. So I think these kind of stories are even more important for them. Right? Absolutely. And actually that leads to a, a question um, that has come in, which is, um, you know, are these archetypes that you are uh, painting and presenting uh, helpful for people today. What do they represent to us? Justin, you've got this amazing work on the screen. I wonder if you would maybe want to address that and say a little bit about this piece. 
Uh, yeah, this is inspired by Tolkien um, and uh, some of the events kind of going on behind the scenes um, referenced in the Silmarillion. So, you know, uh, events directly preceding uh, those of, of The Hobbit. Um, and it, they're just really wonderful moments. I, I The Silmarillion in general is just, uh, you could illustrate for your entire life and still not get through a tenth of it. Um, and, and it's been wonderful to watch artists try, like Ted Naismith. I, I, I love following his work um, uh, for that reason. There's just so much wonderful, interesting stuff. And like you mentioned, that, that there is um, elements that feel true to our lives now. Um, one of the things I love about fantasy art, I think, is, is its ability to personify um, psychological struggles that we have through, you know, monsters and wizards and magic and and that they aren't just um, these elements, um, you know, that you're actually this character battling some other character, but this can be a way of, of processing uh, your feelings about um, life and about your experiences with other people. And, and I think art for me for a long time, this scene included are, are me trying to process uh, my feelings about um, things I'm trying to overcome or, or think through or just understand. Um, and for me, visuals have always been the way that I've done that um, better than any other format. They've helped me kind of express those feelings and then also understand them for myself. Um, I love making images for that reason that so many times they're a journey that um, I, don't, I don't necessarily know where I'm going to end up or what's going to be revealed in the image until it's, until it's painted. Um, and so I love, I tend to really enjoy, um, images of struggle, uh, of, of conflict and, and chaos. Uh, and so most of the images are going to be either the moment before the chaos or the moment of the chaos, uh, uh, in, in my work. I just, I find myself more, more drawn to, to that kind of thing. And again, much of it is, uh, psychological, trying to overcome something uh, mm -hmm. that you're working through in your own mind. Thank you. Victor, um, how do you how do you approach, we're going to go to Ian next, but here's one of yours. Um, how do you approach thinking about the characterizations? Are there archetypes that you like to explore or, uh, you know, are you just uh, kind of developing things as you go? Um, well, before as, I answer that, that. Not necessarily being 100% clear of where they're going. Sure, yeah, before I talk about that, I actually want to continue the conversation that I th thought was great that Ian and Justin started, you know, about how myth is still relevant today and mm -hmm. like how it exists bigger than just the story is telling. Like, I personally feel that a lot. I mean, from the way that I started drawing, I mean, it, it, it's in a sense, it's like an escape for me from the reality, from the small, um, you know, four wars that I was confined in as, as a kid. Um, in some way, like my mom tell me, I forgot about this, but like she said, I will actually reverse what's happening in class in my drawing. Like for example, if I was bullied at school that day, I will actually become, you know, like someone who like tell on, uh, not tell on, but like, like save the kid from being bullied, like uh, alternative universe that something maybe I wish had happened. Um, and I agree with Justin that so much, you know, of the struggle we see, we can project our own difficulties, you know, onto these characters and then get strength from these people. Um, and what I love about fantasy, I'm also a big fan of Tolkien. Um, although I wish not all the bad guys are dark skin and all the <laughs> good guys right. are like, you know, like <laughs> in um, but I, I, what I love about fantasy and the archetype is that they're somehow um, abstracted and also extracted from our reality enough that um, it become universal in the sense that like for different people who see it, they might be able to learn different lessons or, or um, get different messages uh, mm -hmm. from them. And, and I thought that's really wonderful. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, very well said. Can I catch the- Ian, can you, you jump in on that question? In terms sure, yeah, just- um, uh, I've been very lucky and I love all stories, all kinds, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, I don't actually read a lot of fantasy. Um, I did, but uh, these days I like, I like stories about real people. 
and then I just put horns and wings on them and, and they sell <laughs> sell better. And like I say, it's a disguise and you can talk about things. But I, I, um, I find that real people in real life are the best fantasy characters ever. I can't believe what we do. I can't believe what we're capable of. Um, both the horrifying things and the absolute wonderful amazingness uh, that human beings are capable of too. And I find that the horrible things get talked about a lot more quite rightly, they're, they're very dramatic. When if you talk about a war, choices come down to black and white very often. It's the, the gray disappears and it's easier for us to talk about conflict that way. But um, I actually, when I was a kid, I had a copy of Dante's Inferno mm -hmm. and it was illustrated by Dory and it was those beautiful black and white drawings where you, know, you watch Dante go down to the different planes of hell and and then finally goes up to heaven. And as he's going down through hell, everybody looks like they're having a great time. You know, they're all naked and they're roiling around and everybody's like you know, <laughs> having a party. I mean, with a few pitchforks and, and suffering looks, but otherwise they look fun. And then, then he goes up to heaven and everyone is standing there like this, playing their harp, bored out of their mind. And I just, even as a kid, I thought, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. Heaven's supposed to be the awesome place. So a lot of my career is kind of dedicated to trying to portray powerful good, not just powerful evil. And of course, if you're going to do powerful good, you can't mm -hmm. cheat, mm -hmm. right? And make powerful evil less. So I do enjoy going in and drawing the demons and monsters and the, the terrible things. But then I like to find the heaven that's stronger and more compelling. And it's harder for, I think for most people, it's harder to draw mostly because uh, good emotions, powerful emotions, love, even just to say the word love, you feel the energy go out of the room when you're talking to film executives, love. It's not that kind of movie. And it's like, yes, it is. <coughs> I love good stories and love stories. Um, and and I, I find that it's because with evil, you can disfigure good and it looks evil. With mm -hmm. good, you just have to show the thing. And the thing has to have a context or it's not good. Good is doing the right thing in the face of all the bad choices you could have made. Good is doing something kind for someone and not talking about it. You know, it's, it's a strength, but it's a strength in motion. So yeah. it's, a, it's a harder thing to portray. It's one of the reasons, Victor, that I, I love your work so much. It's joyous. Yeah, no matter what it is, it's just, it's this beautiful swirls of color and in your lines and everything I just find you know I find this beautiful uh light and Justin it's not to disparage the battles in the dark machine oh I love that stuff <laughs> well speaking I'm of actually, joyous this this Yoda is really joyous <laughs> a little bit about what it has been like to bring some of those characters to life well just to give credit to Yoda here by the way um Stuart Freeborn was the head of the creature department for Lucasfilm at the time. And in all the history books, Stuart Freeborn designed this. It was actually designed by, uh, the final design was designed by Wendy Froud of, of the Froud fame, Brian and Wendy. Um, and you can tell, it, it looks like a, a Froud elf or creature. Mm. And uh, Stuart absolutely oversaw the department and did a lot of great sculpts too and helped get it very close. I think he helped bring in the, the some of the wisdom into the eyes and stuff, but Wendy did the final. So, and Wendy's a good friend and it was a real treat to take her character and try and help it into a new form because we're doing the prequels and we're allowed to digitally animate this character now. So I took Yoda and I was supposed to draw Yoda from the moment he was born right through to very, very old Yoda. Uh, one point in that beard that he ties under his chin like that. Um, so this was just part of that. This was just showing the animators how Yoda could sit and talk at a slightly younger, more spry age. Don't forget he's 800 years old, so <laughs> younger still is pretty old. But um, yeah, it just it's, it's fun. I don't have to invent the character. I love to invent things, but I don't have to be the author. I get just as much pleasure out of someone handing me something and letting me put that character on him play them out, you know, perform them. Um, I love collaboration. I love before, you know, the, the internet kind of collaboration we're doing now. I love being in a room with people and starting a drawing and passing it along and seeing what it comes back like. It's just, it's fun. And I, I think that's an important part 
of the storytelling process too. <laughs> it should be fun. It should make people gasp with awe, but also go, woohoo, you know? I think that's and a I really that important in, I find that in both of your work, it's just so powerful with emotion. Mm-hmm. You know, your, your battles are practically falling off of the scene. They're so, you know, lively and rich and stuff. So, um, yeah, for me, that's, that's my goal in mythology and my goal in characters is to find the powerful good. So if you're responding to one, it's either because it's challenging that or it is that, but that's, that's my mission. Yeah, if I can chime in, like, I thought it's interesting that Ian said, uh, you said, like, fairy tale used to be for all children, and now you don't feel like that's the case anymore. Mm-hmm. But I'm starting to wonder, like, hearing what you say, and also, you know, of course, like, the influence Star Wars has on the culture, I wonder maybe we just shifted the kind of fairy tale that our children consume. I feel like these are the modern mythologies, and um, like you said, in the end, they're all story about people like you know if you strip away the you know galaxy all those um costume and like for for example for me star wars is about it doesn't matter where you come from right even if you're dead it's like the most evil guy in the world like you still (laughs) decide your own destiny and what kind of life you want to live and in the end i feel like that is a fable you know that is a fairy tale yes it is for children yeah i I absolutely agree with you a lot of what we do in film and so on is for everybody and whether we like it or not children watch them right <laughs> you know, if they don't at your house they they will at their friends yeah. and that's very close to the old fairy tales and things so they do get to hear things and see things that are maybe older than we would think is appropriate for them yeah yeah, yeah. but Thank i agree you. star wars is also about real people especially the first ones because he had come straight off of american graffiti which was his college years, right? And it was about falling in love and having to go off to college and all those things. And all he did for Star Wars was put it in the galaxy far, far away. It's still about growing up and falling in love and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's coming up age. Yeah, coming coming up age. Up age. exactly. Um, Justin, is there uh, something of that in, in this piece? It's quite extraordinary. It's beautiful. Um, this piece, uh, I think has more to do with with travel um, and feeling small in a in a giant wonderful world full of um, tons of possibilities. Um, you know, both both good and evil. But um, uh, it is it is about possibility. And and uh, I love backpacking. I love hiking. Um, and uh, I have there's a group of friends I go out to a lot of the national parks with every now and then, and we'll do. Uh, you know, two weeks in the back country of, you know, Yosemite or the Pacific Northwest, um, the Cascades uh, up, up in, we love going up into Washington and California, but one of, one of my favorite things is, is uh, that sense of being up on some ridge or some cliff and, and overlooking this giant world below um, and feeling small, or especially being out at night, um, out when you're away from the city and there's no light pollution and you can actually see, you know, galaxies overhead. Um, I, I love uh, that sense of, of wonder at the world. And so um, I think this is part of that. Um, again, you know, this is done sort of near the beginning of, of the pandemic. So there is a sense of like what is coming. There's an ominous edge to a lot of these, these uh, images from this series called A Plague of Dragons. Um, uh, but, I'll, but hopefully not despair either. Like I, I, I hope that in, in all of them, there's hope still. And again, wonder at at uh, at the the new world we have because um, we do live in in a uh, you know in an amazing time, all things considered. That we are you know talking to people across the globe instantaneously. That we're beaming pictures you know across the globe to one another. I, I think as as dark and ominous as it may seem, like there is something truly magical that has occurred in our lifetime, and so. You know, while these a lot of these are certainly set within a you know medieval fantasy world, I hope that they capture a little of of that wonder at at, uh, at I don't know where we are right now and the possibilities moving forward. Thank you, Justin. Yes, beautifully said and spectacular work. Uh, we have a question from the audience for Victor, and I'm going to go back to the piece. I'm sorry, uh, I just want to comment on. Oh, this. please go right ahead. It's really nice, and and you know the moment I saw it, I 
get that feeling. Like it's not very just simple black and white, like evil or good. It's like mixed. There's opportunity. There's danger, and I feel like that is also. I mean, what I realized, like slowly growing up, that like you know the dark and light is not two things side by side. It's a scale. You know, and sometimes they actually wrap around, whereas the light is sometimes if you cross the line, it becomes the darkest. It's like people say, right, like it's darker before the dawn. And it kind of reminds me, this piece actually reminds me of um, the Chinese word for danger, which is wei ji. But you, if you um, divided that two characters side by side, actually mean danger opportunity. Um, so, I mean, I feel like that's also ingrained in, you know, the Chinese culture that everything has two sides. It's, it's kind of like, you know, how you play it. And then um, even with the most devastating thing, there could be something like good come out of it. And it, I don't know, like I, I saw this piece and I definitely get that, you know, like even with the overwhelming, um, you know, fire breathing dragons, like you still have that little like sliver of a moon and that tranquility of this like star starry sky behind it. Um, so I, I definitely feel like it has very you know like interesting mix of feelings absolutely uh, yeah. and that beautiful break in the clouds on the horizon with the light pouring mm -hmm. through it's really beautiful. yeah and the light is mirroring the fire so i'm like wondering is the village on fire or is the sun coming out and you know a new day starting it's like you a lot of questions can be asked and generate a lot of curiosity about this piece thank you thank you and we have a question from juan um who would like to know a little bit more about the creation of uh, Victor's Utopia. So I'm going to go back to that one and um, maybe see if you could fill in a few details for our viewers. Sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like the creative process of this is very similar to Justin's like big fish, big fish, alligator son. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a story that, um, well, it was for a calendar project called Frogfolia, which is no longer in existence, but it's quite a like cool project by a print shop that is theme themed around frogs. So it's very open-ended. Anything to do with frogs is fine. So that's the only requirement. Um, and I started thinking like, what kind of story can I tell with a frog and sort of um, considering, you know, the shape, the big belly and one thing just led to another. And I came up with this whole elaborate story about how um, frogs are always, you know, making those noises, like ribbit, ribbit, is actually trying to tell, you know, people, hey, the world is ending, you need to change the way you're living. But of course, we're too dumb to realize it. And there's like this, <laughs> you know, like master frog who saved the last piece of land inside his belly and sort of give human a second chance after uh, the world is flooded from, you know, global warming, rather climate to be like, yeah. It, That's great. Yeah, it's just- <laughs> Love it. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I sure. wonder if each of you might say a little bit about your training and how you kind of came to this subject matter. Did you go to, I know that Victor, you did go to formal art school, but did, did uh, you, for example, Ian, how, how were you trained? I am very classically trained. I, I did eventually take art in school. It was my last year of what we call high school that was in Scotland. Um, and I went to the Glasgow School of Art. So mm -hmm. went to the Charles Ray Macintosh <clears throat> building that's burnt down twice now, along with my thesis. No great loss there, but the building was amazing. And um, it was, uh, by then I knew I was going to be a writer, not an artist. <laughs> and I applied to an art school almost on a whim and got in there instead. And so my life kind of did this for a while where words disappeared and pictures became my principal words. <clears throat> and I was illustrating a lot of classics and getting to know a lot of stories and, and so on. So I actually, you were saying about the 30 years in film, I started in publishing. I have 10 years as a book cover, record cover artist. Uh, I did prints and things. I did advertising and all kinds of stuff. And it's, I still do. I still love illustrating. I still love doing pictures for words because words were the thing that were precious to me. And eventually, 10 years after that, I got into the film industry because 
they paid me enough to start writing. Mm. And I have a 30 year career as a writer as well, uh, which most people don't know because you have to be in that world. Um, I read a lot of <clears throat> screenplays. Um, I have published some books. I have two books coming out this year. I continue to take the stories in that closet back there, which is just crammed wall to wall with my stories. And congratulations. Can you tell us what the closet? What books are going to be coming out? Uh, something called Once Upon a Time in a Sketchbook. So it's a sketchbook with a story. Um, I have a revised version of something called Shadowline, which <laughs> looks like my art book, but it's actually, it's a novella on an interviewer that doesn't exist that wrote the book. And he comes to get the interview from me with a secret mission of his own and mm -hmm. dis discovers all kinds of incredible things. He even kills me at one point and that brings me back to life. Um, but it's really, it's a fictional version of the creative journey. So it's what happens when, <clears throat> when an idea comes into my head and comes out of the other side as a picture, what actually happens. So I dramatize that as characters and so on. And it was just to teach people how to draw and how to be creative and how to not be afraid of the big blank white page. That's an, as you said, it's an opportunity as well as a, a you know, reflection of whatever you're feeling at the time. So, um, I did four years of art school. I have an honors degree in design. Uh, I didn't learn to paint. That happened when I left. I went down to London and, and started working as an illustrator and mostly doing black and whites because I knew how to draw. Um, and then I got this commission to do a record cover for Jess Rattal, um, mm -hmm. who were a huge band at the time, still, still pretty big. And they were my favorite band. So somehow you have to just level up when one of those yeah, come that around, in. you just have to be, be better than you are. But there was a, uh, a wonderful illustrator, Brian Saunders, who just mm. people these days know him for the stamps he paints in Britain. But he's a wonderful teacher and he recognizes artists that are struggling. And he saw me trying to paint and he just called me in and said, Ian, Ian, no, here. He put a piece of paper up and he'd do this beautiful wash with watercolor. Let the water do the work. Here you do it. And I would do it and he'd go, good, do it again. And he just literally had me paint beside him until I learned how to use watercolor. Mm -hmm. And thank you forever, Sandy. It's just a, what a gift. It's part of the reason I'd like to teach. It's part of the reason I'd like to give back is I've never forgotten that generosity that four years of art school didn't give me. So, um, this piece that was on the screen there, that was digital, but digital is just a new form of oil paint, you know, which is an alternative to watercolor. It's, it, you know, it's all ways to tell stories. And these days, by the way, I don't see any difference between pictures and words. They're the same. They both can tell stories. They both, can, you know, carry a little capsule of meaning. And it's how you put them together that tells the story. Thank you. So that's my dream. Wonderful. Justin, how about you? Were you formally trained? And uh, how did you move in this direction? Uh, yeah, I, I was, though, like Ian, I didn't really uh, start, I guess, until afterwards. Um, and I, I found that I, I just hadn't learned any enough of what I wanted. I couldn't create the things that I wanted. And so I was still casting about for how to you know, plug the gaps in my education. And, and uh, this is in the era before the Internet. And uh, one of the best resources I had at the time was a, was a library that had a bunch of step-by-step -step guides. I don't know if anybody remembers that, that old step-by-step -step graphics. I remember them. <laughs> yeah, I so I, they had one by Peter DeSev, one by Greg Manches. Um, and I remember I, I stole them, I stole them. And I never gave them back, not ever. I, <laughs> I literally took opportunity away from the generations that followed after me and I have. <laughs> I don't regret it. Um, they're on the shelf behind me, actually. They've been with me now 20 years. Um, I'll never give them back. Uh, one of them, actually, Corey Gobby stole from me. So I uh, maybe that's maybe that turnabout's fair play there. But um, uh, it was wonderful having those as guides. And I'm forever thankful to, uh, to Manchester and, and to Sev for their contributions to art education through those books. Um, they uh, both heavily in, informed my own work early on. And to this day, uh, they're still big influences. Um, later on, 10 years later, though, after I'd worked uh, in the industry for seven or eight years, uh, I was not getting 
the work I wanted. I was not happy with the work I was doing. Um, had kind of like a um, uh, an existential crisis almost that that what was I even doing with myself? Um, and uh, decided that I needed to reinvest um, into my education. And this is again, you know, it's kind of a hard thing to do. You know, ten years into your career, essentially, and uh, I ended up. Uh, going to the IMC and and uh, the illustration masterclass and learning from uh, Donato and Charles Vest was there and Dan DeSantos and again Greg Manches and um, it was wonderful uh, spending time with them. But I would say that I studied after that I studied with Tom Fluharty um, and Pitar Maselzia and probably that was probably the 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 best thing I ever did in my career was I you know seek out professionals who were doing what I wanted to do and and um, had, you know, I, I felt so much, um, they had figured so much out and I wanted to know how. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they were both, uh, kind enough to, um, uh, give me some guidance. And I remember with Pitar, I actually spent a day in the Rijksmuseum looking at a, a painting of Rembrandt's, uh, Jeremiah, uh, lamenting the burning of Jerusalem. It's kind of a small little, little painting. And we sat in front of that painting for, I don't know, it was like three hours. And he just told me all his thoughts on the painting for three hours. And I think I got more in those three hours of just looking at that Rembrandt with Pitar um, than I had in, you know, the previous 15 years. Um, and so, I don't know, I, uh, it's hard to say, you know, um, art education, if it ever ends truly, you know, I, I feel like we're all there where we're all going to be continuing to push that further as our entire lives as curious uh, individuals who want to know, like, how other artists did what they did and um, what else is possible out there. And, uh, and yeah, anyway, uh, that's all I would I would leave that as uh, a big thank you to to all the people who've who've given me guidance in my career. I would not be here without you. That's a wonderful tribute for sure. Victor, how about you? What was your training like? And um, were you moving in this direction in art school or did that happen later? Um, well, I didn't have any formal training until RISD. And I honestly wasn't sure if I would even be accepted. Uh, RISD was the only art school I applied because in, well, in Hong Kong, art is not really considered a viable career option. I mean, even now it's still very difficult, very, limited uh, opportunities. So, I mean, my <clears throat> parents are quite supportive, but they did tell me that, you know, like their point of view of the stark future if I go into it. So I thought, you know, like I should just give it a shot and apply to one of the best art school in the world. If I get it, maybe, you know, I have a chance at succeeding. Um, and luckily I got in and I was, you know, one of the poor, poorest student for the longest time. Like I, most people had, um, you know, went to art high school, had a lot of knowledge in the art history. Even now I'm so, I, I agree with Justin, I never, and I'm still learning like great artists name that I'm really supposed to know, but I'm, I'm still kind of like filling the blank into that structure and, you know, understanding how things in, influence each other and how they fit together. Um, and then, I mean, the RISD education is, is very great. Like it, um, you know, gave me the work ethics that I have. Um, and I think the most valuable thing is giving me a community of uh, friends that I can still rely on if I, if I need uh, some suggestions, some input, some feedbacks on my work. Um, I feel like that is the hardest thing after graduating, not having the critique in class and having like, especially if you share online, like people tend to be nice and just say nice things. And, but sometimes you just need like that honest opinion, you know, like how can I push it further? Um, what is lacking? And I feel like having that community is, is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And actually uh, there's a question relating to your comments from Melissa Howell, who's a professor of illustration at SCAD. Um, and she is wondering uh, what advice you might actually have for uh, students these days who are interested in entering the field of illustration. Well, I feel like I feel like the illustration landscape is ever shifting. Uh, in some way, 
it touches on so many different industry now like it, like what we're showing here is only very small example of what illustration can do um so i feel like when we're at school like we're given a structure and we're being taught a certain way, which is great. Um, but there are also many opportunities. So don't despair if you feel like you're not clicking with the class or the assignment is not interesting to you. I think it's very important to remember why you go to art school in the first place. Like no one go to art school because they want to have a Lamborghini or like a. You know, <laughs> like we love what we're doing and. Like for a while, I almost lost that passion um, at RISC wow. actually, because because I was trying so hard to catch up, you know, trying so hard to fit in um, that it at some point become not fun. Um, and uh, what saved me was actually my sketchbook like that I was doing during, you know, like liberal arts, uh, like English 101. Um, and that's what I was still enjoying art. So I think just remember to find a way to hang on to that passion because it's so easy to lose it, whether at school or when you just have to pay bills and take on jobs you don't love, you know, just constantly remind yourself why you're doing that. Great advice, thank you. Ian, would you like to chime in on a little bit of advice for future illustrators? Yes. Um... There's so many opportunities for artists now that didn't exist when I started. Um, games and films have bludgeoned with job opportunities. Th there's a trap there though. And that's that when you're part of a collaborative piece and, and everything you do is offered to a director who chooses whether they're going to use it or not, you can mistake that for whether it's any good or not. Um, and it can destroy, I've, I've have so many emails from young artists who say, <clears throat> I, I took your classes, I did everything you said, I have the job of my dreams, I'm the art director of this and that movie and studio and so on, why do I want to give up? And the, the answer is that you train like a Jedi, you train with all these amazing powers, and then you give it to someone else. And you never remember to give it to yourself. So <clears throat> my best advice to, to not just students, but to professional artists as well, always, always, always have a soul sketchbook. And that's a book, it's different from your other sketches. It's a book that every day you put something on the pages that you're passionate about, something that makes you really excited. It can be a negative emotion too, if you want. It can make you really afraid. But I, I think if you can capture joy, something you'd run naked in the snow just to see, put it in the book. And it doesn't matter how you put it in the book. Put it in by drawing it or writing it or tearing it out of a magazine or stealing it from a library. Just put it in the book. And don't look back through the book. Just do it every day. So that six months from when you started, you go through and you look at every page of the book. And I guarantee, if you were honest about what really moves you, that's a snapshot of your soul. And number one, it will keep you sane. It will help you stay centered and find who you are and stay passionate about the things you love. And number two, it will help your job. Because when you present a design like this, you know, show John Carter meeting Deja Thoris and she's already getting married to someone else. And it's that moment where you just don't know the next step. You don't know what happens. You don't know the way forward. That came from something in my sketchbook and came from something in real life that happened to me. And I put it in there and it was happy, sad. It was bittersweet. I was happy for the person. I sat for myself. Mm -hmm. And you just take a little piece of that soul and you put it inside the design you're doing and it comes to life. So I recommend that for students. Keep a soul sketchbook always. I love the idea of a soul sketchbook. Thank you. That's so helpful. Um, how about you, Justin? Do you um, have a little bit of advice for students? Oh, let's go to that one. There we go. Uh, yeah, I, I would have said the exact same thing that, uh, that Ian and Victor <laughs> said. I, I, and it's the, the sketchbook is the, the number one thing. Uh, and, and that's one of, because I love that it, it's one of those things that it's not necessary to be skilled. Uh, to have a sketchbook. Like you need no training whatsoever. My sketchbook 
is it probably looks about the same as it would have 30 years ago when I was just using stick figures. Uh, that's all you need to make, you know, compositions of incredible elaborateness and uh, capture your ideas about a scene that you may have read in Tolkien or what, where, or that you've seen in real life, but want to reinterpret. Um, all you need is stick figures to capture the essence of that idea. And then, Hey, maybe 10 years later, you'll paint it. Um, if, if that's what you need, if you need to go develop the skills in order to actually communicate that scene, like you want it to, but the best thing ever is to have it. So I, I can't really improve on, on what Ian and Victor have said about that. So I'll, I'll add something else. And that is, um, read and, um, read, write and world travel are three of the most important things you can do to broaden yourself as a human being. Um, but I also think as an artist or a creative of any sort, they're, they're indispensably important. Um, uh, I don't know which, which of you it was who mentioned sort of filling up uh, yourself and then pouring it out um, mm -hmm. earlier, but that idea uh, I think is really, really important for your own work. Um, when you're in getting art education, you're gonna be doing, you know, drawing formal things, tables and chairs, learning to draw squares and capture light and shadow on form. These are very, very boring things, but they're like knuckle push-ups for your artistic brain. You need them. You have to be training like this, but they're, they're not gonna be fun. It's up to you to find that fun stuff and, and uh, to sort of fill your mental library with those things. And so um, I've always been a big fan of, if you can travel, um, number one, it's, it's, it's just one of the best ways, uh, to get new experiences, to broaden your understanding of humanity, of what's, of, of other for, of other lifestyles, of other lives, um, the ways that other cultures live that you might never have guessed about these things, all of these things make your work more colorful, more interesting, um, and broaden, uh, your ability to communicate. To, to other humans. So, and to say something interesting too. So I, I'm, uh, I'd also say get out of the, get, get away from people. As much as I would say, go travel and meet people. There's also some um, value in getting back to nature too. So uh, every background and all of my images is a place I've been, including this one. Um, it was uh, the ruins of an abbey in the middle of uh, the middle of England. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the place now, but, um, this image is just me trying to recreate the magic of, uh, seeing that place at night. Um, most of the backgrounds in my work though, are places I have been and either I'm working from a photo I've taken myself, or I'm just trying to recapture the magic that I felt in that place, like this scene where I had no photo, um, cause this was 25 years ago and no digital cameras and, a Polaroid just doesn't work when you're trying to do night photography in an old abandoned abbey. So I have to just use my memory. Um, but I, I, I find those experiences um, getting out into the, the wilderness, into uh, abandoned places, um, out into nature, out under green leaves and open skies uh, to be so important to um, uh, nourishing your art, artistic soul. So that's my advice. Thank you. Wonderful advice and comment. Um, could I add something? It's just yeah. an observation that I saw. I was like looking at the slides while you guys were talking and I noticed like, for example, Justin did a lot of dragons, but none of the dragons design were exactly the same. I feel like that's also one way that artists keep themselves interested, even if it's like a familiar uh, subject matter. And I think it was Einstein who said that creativity is intelligent at play or having fun. <laughs> and I feel like I see I see that, like the kind of fun and design decision you make into, like you, you have into the dragon design. Like for example, if we can go back to the one that's in the water, um, there's a dragon in uh, the water, the right? For example, this one, like the scale is much thinner and kind of like resemble that of a fish, right? Because it's like a water dragon, at least that's my interpretation. And then there's another one with the hobbit um, and like covered in gold. Like I thought it was so interesting, the dragon scale resemble gems, you know, like rubies or like sapphires. Mm. And I, I feel like for people who are in, interested in art and look long enough, these are the Easter eggs that reward the audience. They understand, you know, this dragon doesn't just represent you know, this danger, but it's also the 
enticement like it itself is also embodiment of that you know like lust um, and greed and I feel like small details like that keep artists interested in their work and also mm. make their work much more rich for for the audience thank you can I chime in on that too just for a sec um I I heartily endorse the travel and even if you can't physically travel travel through books and the internet but travel to other places look at other cultures and other mythologies dragons exist in every culture of the world and they mean different things in different parts of the world um i'm actually i'm working on a project a korean project right now uh for a book that <clears throat> i don't believe has been translated outside of korea it's called the bird that drank the tears and it has a dragon and that dragon's a plant a living plant and it has a different purpose and spirit than something that is greedy and, and uh, to be feared. And it's the same uh, in China, right? The, the dragons there are, are gods and have all kinds of really wonderful um, purposes with mankind and mm -hmm. things that they give to mankind. And so um, it, you can easily get locked into something, especially by television, you know, because it refers back to a lot of European Middle Ages right. mythology. Totally. And I've always thought it, it's really good to, okay, now go to India. See what they were doing at the same time. Go her, read the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Understand that in a different culture, the same archetype appears, but this is what it meant here, here in this place. Right. And that frees you up too. Now, when you go to do your own mythology, you can take an archetype, but don't be bound by what you thought it was. It could be whatever you, it means to you personally. Thank you, Ian. Great comments. And that interconnectivity between cultures is, is so important to remember. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting close to our one o'clock hour, but there's a question here that I'd love to bring forward um, from uh, someone on YouTube. And that is, um, if you're working on personal work, um, maybe perhaps even on illustration, how do you decide which ideas are worth pursuing um, in terms of uh, you know how you're going to move forward, and how do you work with um, you know kind of yourself when there's no art director to offer commentary? <laughs> right, so I'm gagging myself because I got an instant answer. All ideas are worth pursuing. What are you talking uh, about? Yeah. All ideas. It's what you do with the idea that makes it great. Yeah. Right. The idea that's worth pursuing is from your soul sketchbook, right? If it didn't give you passion, if you didn't want to do it, hijack it. Find something that you do want to do and tell, make it, make it about that. But yeah, it's got to be something that has meaning for you. But any idea can work. Of course it can. Great. Yeah, I, I forgot, like, another wise people have said, like, there's no lack of good idea. There's always good ideas. Like, how do you bring the idea to fruition? Yeah. Right. How do you execute it and what can you extract and distill from it? That's the difficult part. Great. Justin? Yeah, there's there's uh, I, something I talk about, the, the Venn diagram of uh, what you're interested in versus what people will pay you for. Uh, you know, <laughs> and it's I think starting out like, yeah, you just have to do them all. Uh, get out there and just start doing doing the ideas that are exciting to you and see which ones hit that narrow overlap. Uh, it's dangerous to go purely into that other side though, where it's only the things that people will pay you for. Mm -hmm. That's when you start to lose your soul and, and forget why you did this. Um, and like Victor was saying, there's better ways to get a Lamborghini if that's why you're here. Um, <laughs> you know, this this isn't the industry for you if, if that's what you're yeah. after. Like it's, it's better to stay as, as far on the other side as you can, but it is nice if you can find that narrow margin in between where you've hit the thing that is clearly speaking to other humans because there's something important there you know if it's something that speaks to you and it speaks to others you know there may be a reason that that that's the case and you should chase that yeah i can't agree more and um i think throughout the past 10 years of me working i also slowly realizing that you can create your own market like of course it's nice if you find like a patron or a client that just love your work instantly. But I realized that artists also can educate their audience and educate their client. Like when I was starting out, like a lot of clients, especially, you know, financial clients, they were pushing back on using metaphors with, you know, animals or mythologies to represent Wall Street. 
Um, but I see that changing. And of course, that's not my soul like doing like far from it, but like our generation, I feel like of illustrator are very interesting in that and collectively kind of pushing that. And you see, you know, that is changing. Like the, the client's much more open to it and they're much less literal. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we are all part of this organic thing that keep evolving. So what we do have an impact um, on the entire industry. Yeah, plus I think what people universally like, right? There is the Venn diagram thing for sure, but anywhere what people are interested in is truth. They don't like being lied to. They can tell when you're faking. They can tell when you're copying. They can tell when you weren't interested. Yeah. You are unique, you are special, everyone is. And if you can honestly share that viewpoint with somebody, the truth of that will connect. Um, it's just that that's hard to do sometimes when it is a, a, an advertisement for something that has no meaning whatsoever. But for me, I grew up on, on great books and I grew up on comics. You know, I had a subscription to Superman when I was four years old. And, you know, those really don't have a lot of weighty things in terms of literature. And yet, here's a creature from another planet <laughs> who comes to Earth to help us. And he has no reason. He's not getting paid. He's not getting his Lamborghini. Um, he's not even part of this planet. Why on Earth would he stick around and help people? And I'd like to think it's because he saw something good in us, worth protecting and worth saving. And right. so I took that meaning from that. I gave that my truth. So even if the subject, even if the client, if what you're doing has no meaning whatsoever, bring meaning to it, but bring, make sure it's your meaning and your truth, something that really resonates with you. And that I find always connects to some audience somewhere. So you're bound to be someone in the world that has that experience too. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to end our discussion on. It has gone too fast because I know we could <laughs> just keep talking for a very long time. But we have been so honored to have the three of you on today to share your work and your ideas. And I just want to remind our visitors that um, these incredible artists' work will be on view at the Norman Rockwell Museum for another week in Enchanted, History of Fantasy Illustration. Uh, the exhibit will then travel to the uh, Hunter Museum of American Art in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the Flint Museum in Michigan. So we are excited about that. Uh, can't thank you enough for being so supportive and um, for the beautiful work that you share with the world. Thank oh, you're you all. Welcome. It was a gift to us too. Honor. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our viewers. We're so happy you were able to join us. Uh, I'll just mention we have another wonderful fantasy related show coming up, um, opening on November 13th. We have an exhibition of the art of illustrator Jan Brett, yeah. uh, stories near and far. And so we look forward to that exhibition this fall and over the holidays. So hope Fantastic. to see you all again soon. All right. And thank you again.